The Museo Archeologico in Naples, Italy is one of many museums around the world that have Egyptian collections. But this collection contains many fascinating pieces, from an ink pot shaped as a baboon, a mummified crocodile, and a mummified woman dating back from the reign of Pharaoh Susanus. The Silver Pharaoh. But apart from pharaohs and gods, I've come here today to investigate an ordinary married couple's life, their death, and to bring them back to life. and his wife, Tane. They lived around 3,250 years ago, and the summer suit worked for none other than Ramses II. The summer suit was actually the chief captain of Ramses II's ships. Ramses II lived around the mid part of Egypt's history. In fact, Cleopatra was much closer to us and lived at 30 BC, 3,200 years before Egypt was unified by King Narmer. That's around 5,000 years ago. In the middle part of this time frame comes the famous Tutankhamun. Less than 20 years after Tut came Ramses the Great. Ramses is Egypt's longest reigning king and lived around 96 years. He was a prolific builder and warrior, constructing many of the monuments that we see today, including the biggest expansion of Karnak and Luxor Temple. To the south, he built Abu Simbel, where he documented his triumph in the Battle of Kadesh. He had over 100 children and many wives, yet his principal wife was Queen Nefertari. Boats played a very important role, not only in everyday life, but also in religious beliefs. Ramses had a large fleet of ships to travel all along the Nile, for either religious ceremonies or to travel in military campaigns. Ships were also used to transport stone to build monuments. Since Pasanasut lived near the end of Ramses' life and was afforded a tomb, he was no doubt the captain that directly transported the king, maybe even on his final journey. Here in Apoli, they actually have four fragments that belonged to Pasanus suit. Here we have a stela, two stela in fact, and two two wall fragments. Here we see Pasanus suit and his wife, Tanetmet, receiving offerings here from their children. And Pasanus suit here, unfortunately he's damaged, giving offerings to Ra. As we move on, the, I love this scene. Here we have Pasanya suit here with his wife, receiving offerings from his son. And here we actually have the, the couple receiving offerings from the tree goddess. Usually she's seen as sycamore, but here she is Hathor. And the barber receiving the water that Hathor is pouring from the trees. As we move on, we have up here a beautiful piece of Pasaya suit with his little beard, and he is giving offerings to the god of the dead, who is in fact Osiris and his sister Isis, with a wrist at the top. Here is a beautiful scene again of Pasaya suit and his children, and his youngest child, which is probably his grandchild and they are receiving offerings of incense for their soul for eternity. The village, Deir al Medina, housed the families of the men that built the royal tombs for almost 400 years. They were so skilled that they were even able to have their own tombs dug into the hills that surrounded the secret village.
However, since his tomb was found in the late 1700s and items being added to the Borgia collection, not much archaeological evidence is available on its exact location. Most nobles were afforded a tomb in the hills behind the Colossi of Memnon, yet experts believe that his tomb is in Saqqara. Behind me is one of the hidden gems in this museum. It is one of the most beautiful pieces that I have ever seen. Not for its dazzling color or for it being clad in gold, but for what it represents. Never before have I seen such a beautiful piece from a tomb. It is Pisani Sut and his wife Talekmet standing here at the edge of a hill where their tomb would be. They are standing here before an offering table with bread and fruits and their bar bird, which is the spirit that is taking flight, which shows their spirit leaving the tomb and entering heaven. And here is Talekmet and Pisani Sut holding sails, catching the wind from the north. As we know, he was the captain for Ramsay's ship. So this is quite a beautiful scene, showing him holding a sail from that ship. But when we investigate this closer, this was actually once fully colored. And today, using our photographic skills, we can actually enhance these colors and bring this piece back to life. Over 3,000 years can cause the paint to chip off from humidity and natural causes. The ancient Egyptians used a mixture of organic pigments, water and egg white to make paint. The most common colors were red and yellow as they could be extracted from the rocks around them. White from limestone and black from coal were also used. The most expensive colors were greens and blues as they were made from ground precious stones such as lapis and turquoise. The powders were mixed together with water and egg white to get the desired texture. When we magnify our artifact, close up, the small flecks of original color can be seen. that we share today. They were real people. So next time you visit a museum like this one, in Napoli perhaps, try and look at these people as part of your history. Just a few minutes down the road, actually, from where I'm living here in Florence, is a monastery that has its own private Egyptian collection. After speaking to them a little bit, they've agreed to let me come in and film the collection to show it. So, let's go see. For thousands of years, we have been fascinated by intriguing objects from ancient Egypt as well as sacred texts from Biblical times. But who were these people that have captured our imaginations with their specifically curated gods? 
with their vast belief in death and life, what secrets overlap in the religions within an ancient Italian monastery? Fiesole in Tuscany, the original Etruscan settlement, up on the hill overlooking Florence, the city founded by Julius Caesar over 2,000 years ago. Our pilgrimage towards history leads us to the very top of the Serene Hills. Originating in 1225, this Catholic church is part of the Franciscan order. Abandoned by the nuns in 1352, later the Franciscan monks would settle here. Born in 1181, St. Francis was a martyr for Christian charity. He was a custodian for nature, and since 1219, annually on the 4th of October, animals are blessed to honor him. St. Francis led several missions throughout Europe, Africa, and the Mediterranean, leading him to become the patron saint of Italy. Although he lived in tumultuous times for religion, his symbol became the flower, showing the delicate side of his nature represented on the ceiling here. In 1219, during the bloodiest Fifth Christian Crusade, St. Francis went to Egypt to try and wage peace. Many of the priests here at this monastery went following in the footsteps of St. Francesco. And as you can see here is an image of St. Francesco when he went into Africa to go and do missionary work, to go and spread the gospel, things like that. The brothers from this monastery have also done the same going into many countries in Africa, many countries in Asia, including also going to Egypt, which is why they have this very special private collection of Egyptian artifacts here in the monastery. But it's so interesting to see that's basically where it started. After meeting with the Sultan of Egypt, St. Francis and his followers were the only Catholics that were allowed to remain peacefully throughout the Holy Land. In the late 1800s, Albert Einstein stayed several times at the monastery while visiting his sister. The statue of Mary and Jesus was given to the monastery and made by his daughter, Margot. The convent of San Francesco is home to many monks and in the early 1900s, an extension was built where the friars could take care of the elderly. St. Francis spoke about a life of modesty, and this is reflected in the rooms of the monks. This monastery is also one of the most forward thinking, having one of the biggest library collections on theology. And today, I've been given private access to their collections from around the world. Mm. 
Being built on the remains of an Etruscan fortress, many items were discovered here from 2,600 years ago, including many Greek objects like this beautiful terracotta vase showing Achilles attending to his pesky heel. Of course, this area was occupied by the Romans, but interestingly, Egyptian Ptolemaic coins from the 3rd century BC were discovered here. Adjacent to the monastery's archaeological treasures is a chapel dedicated to Mary and the angel Gabriel who came and told her that she would give birth to Jesus. In the late 1800s, the monks from this monastery did missionary work in Japan, China and India, returning with exquisite treasure. Although fascinating, there are other pieces that I am far more interested in. The display of foreign cultural objects was conceptualized by Ambrogio Ridolfi, a monk from the monastery in the late 1800s. Reaching out to foreign missions, he insisted that this display would teach young monks to respect other cultures. Brought back from Egypt, this page dates from the 1700s and is from a Franciscan monastery in Luxor. This page from the Gospel is written in Old Arabic as well as Coptic. The Coptic language is derived from the original ancient Egyptian spoken language. By the year 300 AD, Egyptians who were practicing the Christian faith, who were under the rule of the Romans, adjusted their ancient language into the now Coptic. Listening to Coptic, it allows us to hear a glimpse of what the pharaohs would have spoken. But like most things with religion, came turmoil. A 200-year war in the Holy Land began, fighting between Islamic, Christian, Catholics and Jews. Medieval swords from Egypt and other war implements. Imagine the bloodshed these have witnessed. When the final pharaoh of Egypt, Cleopatra, died in 30 BC, the Romans took over the country. Yet many of these Roman emperors depicted themselves in full Egyptian attire, attested by the small clay statue. During the Roman period, the last fragile elements of Egyptian culture held on. A civilization so strong that it changed the invaders. Although in a distinctive style, Egyptian funerary practices continued under Roman occupation. At the back of this Roman death mask, the sacred scarab beetle of Egypt holds up the sun. Made from a paste spread onto linen called cartonage, this death mask shows a beautiful Egyptian woman who died during the Roman period. The Egyptian civilization was forever evolving, so this change in style was nothing new. 
For hundreds of years before the Romans arrived, the Egyptian gods had been adopted by several other civilizations. The Egyptian god of mummification, Anubis, shown in Greek style here. The sister goddesses Isis and Neftis, adjusted into a more Mesopotamian look. These terracotta figurines date back to around 300 BC, when the Greeks arrived in Egypt. The Egyptians' fervent belief in the afterlife was, and still is, tantalizing to outsiders. This Roman-style tomb figurine harks back to an ancient Egyptian tradition spanning thousands of years. Delicately crafted and glazed in the famous Egyptian blue, these faience figurines are servants for the dead. Each one of these figurines was carefully inscribed with a magical inscription. Those who could afford it had hundreds of these placed in their tomb, and once the person was dead, they could call upon these figurines to make their life in the next world leisurely. They loved their lives so much that they wanted it to continue in the next life and be even better. That is why they took so many objects from this life to carry on to the next. Wine, beer, makeup and grain, even a clay effigy of the person's favorite fruit, a pomegranate. For 5,000 years, the Egyptians wanted to take these objects with them. Each piece of pottery is unique and allows us to date a tomb to a specific period based on the unique art style. A lot of people ask, how was a place lit in ancient Egypt? Very simple answer with clay pots, clay lamps such as these. They would have oil inside with a wick and actually these were used to determine the length of a shift for a tomb worker. So if you were painting a tomb in ancient Egypt, you would have your wick, it was a certain length, and by the time the wick ran out, your shift was over. But who were these tomb workers? Fortunately, many were skilled enough to craft their own funerary items, not only for the royals. The wooden eyes of a humble Egyptian bear witness to today's modern world. They wanted to be recognized by the gods on their journey to heaven, and one way to do this was having your face placed above your mummy. In some cases where they couldn't afford a mask, they had a simple anthropoid wooden coffin where they painted their unique facial features. This unknown man lived at a unique village with the sole purpose of creating the Pharaoh's tomb. And with this knowledge, in his spare time, he had the skills to prepare his next life for himself and his family. 
Living in the village of Deir al Medina in the early 18th dynasty meant that this small family could enjoy a life of supreme comfort, relatively different to others who would work the land. The men and women of ancient Egypt, who so carefully contemplated every element of their lives and their death, I wonder if they could speak what version of history they would tell us. This little limestone head, once painted with black to show the eye makeup, was the top of a canopic jar which contained the deceased's mummified internal organs to be reanimated once they had reached the afterlife. These wooden faces from 3,500 years ago allow us to feel just that little bit closer to the past. Closer to a group of people that wanted us to know about every element of their lives. A people that wrote down almost everything that they did. A people closer to us than we could ever imagine. The man who helped us learn more about the everyday Egyptian's life is an Italian Egyptologist named Ernesto Scaparelli, and he had a close connection to this monastery. In 1904, Ernesto Scaparelli stayed with the Franciscan monks at the monastery in Luxor during an excavation, where he donated many of his pieces to the monastery to help encourage the understanding of Egyptian culture. Such as this statue of the jackal god Anubis with the falcon god Horus behind. Many of his discoveries were in the village where the tomb workers lived, dear Al Medina. These pieces were from the everyday people. It might not be gold and treasure as such, but it is invaluable how much information we can learn from these rare, simple pieces. Egypt is a land filled with mystery and strange gods. Yet, these discoveries help us to realize that they were just like us. This 3,400-year-old woven mat comes from Deir al Medina and was made by the hand of one of the residents. The Ka symbol to the ancient Egyptians meant spirit and was shown as raised hands, linking you to your piety towards the gods. Ernesto Scaparelli may have worshipped a different god to the Egyptians, but the ideals remain very similar. In 1904, on the western bank of Luxor, Ernesto Scaparelli rediscovered one of the most pristine tombs dedicated to an incredibly important queen who brought about peace. One of the pieces that I've really, really wanted to see in this private collection is actually a Shabti. I know I'm always talking about Shabtis, but this Shabti is a little bit special. This Shabti was donated by the Italian Egyptologist Ernesto Scaparelli to this monastery. And what's so special about it is, it is a Shabti from Queen Nefertari's tomb, Nefertari the wife of Ramses II. Not many artifacts were found intact in her tomb, apart from a couple Shabtis and a few pots and things like that. And here we have a beautiful Shabti of the Queen. Nefertari's tomb had been raided several times throughout history, taking all of the gold and precious items. However, 
to me, this small shabti of the queen is extremely precious. Created from wood and covered entirely in black perfumed resin. Inscribed with protective texts, these miniatures of the queen are the only things that remain from her magnificent tomb. Nefertari's tomb had been ransacked by the Christians in around 100 AD, who went in and smashed her sarcophagus and ripped her body into pieces. So much for a queen who wanted to only bring about peace through the land and brokered the first ever peace deal between her husband and the rival Hittites to the north. Nefertari, meaning the most beautiful of them all. A well-respected queen by her peers and by the local population of Egypt. One can only hope that these wooden images of the queen would have helped her to reach a peaceful afterlife and become one with the God of Heaven, Osiris. Her husband elevated her to the highest role in all the land. She was married to a mighty pharaoh with the drive to become Egypt's best warrior and a living god. Ramses II's tomb is unfortunately completely destroyed. It has been affected by flooding and earthquakes. I mean, the Pharaoh's mummy was moved out by the priests during the 22nd and the 23rd dynasty. But we do have some things that were found in his tomb, apart from very much little else. We have a shabti of Ramses II in the form of Osiris made out of wood, the same material that his sarcophagus was made out of. And on the Shabti, we can see his royal name, Wusar Maedra Setapendra, the justice of the sun god Ra is justified. The round oval is known as a cartouche and contains the pharaoh's name. On this Shabti, he appears as the god of the afterlife, Osiris. And for many ancient Egyptians, he was the embodiment of Osiris, for he outlived many of the population, living to an age of around 96, when life expectancy was only around 35. Being resurrected by his wife Isis, Osiris became the god of the afterlife and is often associated with the color green. His son Horus is often depicted on the lap of Isis, predating the Madonna and Child statues by 2,000 years. Their devotion to the menagerie of Egyptian gods is unfathomable. Small amulets such as these, made from either faience or bronze, were often worn during life, but more importantly, placed on certain areas of the mummified body to protect them from certain demons. Water from the Nile was the core of life, and amulets to the Egyptian god of the Nile, Hapi, can often be found. Another aquatic deity was Tawarit, the protector of mothers and childbirth. Here on the Faian statue, she holds the child's heart. A 
a mummified crocodile dedicated to the protector of the Nile, Sobek. He had a complex role, being a symbol of fertility as well as protection towards the pharaoh. He even possessed healing qualities. The ancient Egyptians did revere cats, as I've stated many times before. Cats were more for the everyday common people, not really for royalty. So what we have here is a cat mummy. And most of the time, these cat mummies were taken by, were bought by the common people to give to offerings to the cat goddess Bastet to have a peaceful domestic life. Most of the times, though, the priests cheated these people, and inside a cat mummy, you'll find it's actually stuffed with various other items, including feathers, mud, wood, and there might only be one bone from the cat inside a cat mummy. Judging from the shape of this cat mummy, I'm pretty sure it only has a small essence of the cat goddess Bastet inside. The cult of animal mummy offerings thrived during the Ptolemaic times and was a booming business for the priests. There's only one thing that brings us closer to these ancient people. Their immaculately preserved bodies. In a way, they bring us closer to terms with our own mortality. Very interestingly, on one of the missionary expeditions that this monastery led into Egypt, they were offered a mummy, a full-size mummy of an Egyptian priest. And it's quite strange to have a mummy of an ancient Egyptian inside a monastery in the middle of the Italian countryside. But it does allow for the understanding of different cultures and different religions. It's quite a nice, nice idea, I think. This mummy is an Egyptian male priest and his name is written at the bottom here. This mummy's name is Kem Kara. Kem Kara. So here we see the priest Kem Kara being kept by the priests here in Italy. But this 26th dynasty coffin could not be taken on face value alone. Crafted from cedar wood and brightly painted, with a dedication running down the middle, indicating this coffin belonged to a priest. The face was painted red, indicating a man, yet the titles said it was for the lady of the house. Even the name at the end appeared altered. Was this a man or a woman inside? In 2007, the monastery called upon Egyptologists and radiologists to put this question to an end. Not unwrapping the mummy and doing x-rays revealed that the body inside was that of a male priest. Fortunately, a label on one of the bandages had been painted on and was well preserved and revealed his name was indeed Kem Kara. However, 2,700 years ago when this coffin was crafted, it became common practice to recycle others' burial equipment because of the economic decline. Brilliantly wrapped, he was of some importance, 
even having his wig separately mummified and placed above his head. The priest Kem Kara had no death mask, however, he had a panel placed above his head with an image of the sky goddess Nut, interestingly facing forward, breaking away from the Egyptian traditional profile view. This panel was placed over his mummy to protect him on his way to the afterlife. Even to today, the sky goddess Nut is watching over the priest Kem Kara. Egypt is filled with magic and mystery, but if we look closer and deeper, we can still see its humanity. Even though this is such a small collection, the pieces are still quite interesting and quite important, actually. And I know a lot of you will have some things to say about this being here in a monastery, but think about the good it can bring, the cultural connections it can teach us. city where modern lives alongside the ancient. A place that contains secrets from the ancient world. Where modern religion overlaps with the ancient. A symbol of power, 13 to be precise, ancient Egyptian obelisks relocated to Rome. Yet one holy site contains Egyptian mysteries. Beautiful art from times long forgotten. Corridors of gods and royals. And sacred writings inscribed long before Rome had its emperors. Thousands of years before Julius Caesar and Christianity. In the shadows of ancient Rome, what Egyptian secrets lie in plain sight at the Vatican? Founded in 1506, the Vatican's museum holds a huge collection of art amassed by the Catholic Church and previous popes. A collection of over 70,000 artifacts, of which 20,000 are on display. In a room adjacent to the Sistine Chapel, around the altar dedicated to the Virgin Mary, 
is an artifact that you wouldn't expect to find. Pope Pius IX had the story of the Virgin Mary's Immaculate Conception of her becoming pregnant with the Son of God translated into every language known to man in 1854. He even had the story embossed onto silver in Egyptian hieroglyphs. While placing his own name into an ancient Egyptian royal cartouche, but why would an organization that asked Champollion not to translate the hieroglyphs be interested in ancient Egypt? We are at the Egyptian section in the Vatican Museum. I'm so excited to be here. There are so many amazing pieces. As you can see from so many different dynasties, all the way from pre-dynastic times up until the Roman period, so I am very much looking forward to showing everybody some of the amazing pieces here at the museum. Many people think that the ancient Egyptians were obsessed with death. In fact, they were obsessed with life and how they could ensure their next life would be prosperous. Mummification was their way of preserving the body so that the gods could recognize your spirit such as this 22nd dynasty noble woman with her perfectly preserved hair dating back almost 2,900 years. Sharing the same display case is a royal mummy. However, she was not born in Egypt. I've been waiting so long to see her. This is Princess Amun Yedris of the 25th dynasty of Nubia. And she was adopted and moved to Thebes and became a high priestess of Amun and Mut. So to see her, it's so amazing. You can see she would have been wrapped with beads and all of her funerary objects. It's so beautiful. And in Florence is actually her nanny's death mask, which is quite huge. Um, so there's been a lot of debate about Princess Amun Yidris, whether we should send her back to Nubia, to Sudan, or keep her here. But uh, that's a bit of a slippery slope. And I'm so excited to see Princess Amun Yidris here. And uh, in Cairo, there is a beautiful alabaster statue of Amun Yidris, huge alabaster statue. So to see her, it's quite, quite moving, actually. Beautifully wrapped in linen, her mummy would have been covered with these turquoise-colored beads. In a style dating back almost a thousand years before Amun Yedris, the old kingdom of Egypt, these beads would connect her to the goddess Hathor. Several silver and gold amulets were placed across her body, including her heart scarab, which would be used to weigh her heart against the feather of justice at the final judgment before the afterlife. Her tomb was found in Luxor with many wooden artifacts, alabaster and gold. A touching statue set of goddesses were placed at the head and foot of her nested sarcophagi. Isis and Nephthys have protected Amun Yedris for thousands of years. The main protector of Amun Yedris's tomb was the jackal Anubis. He even guarded something that could make Amun Yedris's next life even more leisurely. These little figurines are called Shabtis. If you could afford it, hundreds of them were placed in your tomb. You could call upon them, sort of like servants, to do the jobs you did not want to do in the next life. Each Shabti was given a special spell to invoke its role, and they were specially decorated with individual faces. 
These wooden shabtis, coated in resin, were created for Pharaoh Seti I and are some of the only artifacts remaining from his tomb, found by Giovanni Belzoni. Shabtis could also be lazy, and they needed a special foreman figurine placed there to make sure they do their job. However, a mummy needed something to be cased in, and I'm not talking about tombs, I'm talking about sarcophagi, and some of them could be elaborately decorated. This coffin is a very famous coffin. It's very famous on the internet. However, seeing her in person, the internet's a little photoshopped. She's actually very uh, desaturated online. They've made her, her headdress with the, the neck bit vulture goddess very green. And here she's actually very dull. Um, but still, she's extremely beautiful to look at. This beautiful high-class lady was an ancient Egyptian singer from 900 BC. The goddess Nut pours out water for the bar bird, the spirit of the dead, as she appears as a sycamore tree. During periods of economic decline, many texts could not be put on the walls, so they were drawn into the coffins. The goddess above protecting the dead who is presenting her heart, the source of her soul. The third intermediate period, when Egypt went into severe economic decline, is famed for presenting us with these beautiful yellow coffins. The entire surface area of the coffin was decorated with texts to help the dead get into the afterlife as they could not afford tombs at the time. Yet the yellow coffin style can be found in the 18th dynasty, 300 years or so before the third intermediate period. The inside of this coffin shows the pharaoh Tutmosis III presented as the god Sokar. Clearly the coffin of someone held in high regard by the pharaoh as he is inside the coffin protecting the dead. When the Greeks arrived in Egypt, they began to adopt Egyptian funerary practices, leaving us with some interesting death masks, painted and gilded with gold, inlaid with precious stones such as blue lapis lazuli. When a certain Roman emperor arrived in Egypt, the art dramatically began to change. Julius Caesar and Cleopatra had their infamous love affair, and when that was over, the Romans were in charge of Egypt. Jewelry stitched into painted linen with the image of a beautiful woman from the 3rd century AD found in Antonopolis and then placed over her mummy a lifelike image of a lady living in Egypt. They also loved life and recording what happened in life. Stone scarabs were used to commemorate important events. The grandfather of Egypt's most famous pharaoh had many of these created. The stone scarab of Amenhotep III announces his wedding to his soon-to-be wife, Queen T. These could be mass-produced and handed out as news bulletins. Their son started an artistic and religious revolution. Believing in only one god, Akhenaten can be seen as the first monotheist. 
the art style dating from Akhenaten's reign, known as the Amarna period, is quite distinctive. A wall fragment taken from an Amarna period tomb at Saqqara. The man here wearing his elaborate wig and heavy jewelry, which were given as a gift from the pharaoh. His fine linen, typical of the period, over 3,300 years ago. Before the official is an offering table filled with fruits, breads and flowers. You of course needed to eat in the next life, and this man's tomb shows that he received thousands and thousands of offerings. This fragment from his tomb shows us clearly that he received a thousand beer, a thousand cattle, a thousand geese, and so on. In the 18th dynasty, it was quite common for your family to give offerings to your soul. And for this ritual, you needed a special device. And luckily, the Vatican has these on display. These are offering tables, but what's interesting about this offering table is on the top it shows the, the food, the bread, the animal carcasses, the pieces of uh, meat. And what, instead of putting the actual offering on this little table, they would pour water over here and the water would run out of the spout, giving the essence of the food to the dead. This is known as a hetep, hetep offering. The Pharaoh, of course, needed offerings as well. However, theirs were on a slightly higher level, such as Pharaoh Tutmosis III. A carving from his temple shows two gods pouring the key of life, water, over the pharaoh, making him pure. This is such an interesting piece because what we would usually see as a man here is actually a woman. This is queen and pharaoh, Hatshepsut, here's her name. Maat Kara, the beautiful spirit of the goddess Maat. Here is Hatshepsut with her stepson, who later became the pharaoh, Tutmosis III. You can see his name here, Men Kepera. And here they are standing together, which is quite interesting. It sort of shows a co-regency as both of their names are in cartouches and they are both giving offerings back to Amun. At the bottom here we can even see Hatshepsut's name, Amun Hatshepsut. And this is such an interesting piece to prove that there was a co-regency between the two of them. Over a thousand years before Hatshepsut, the Egyptians buried their pharaohs in grand pyramids. The Vatican holds clues about these man-made mountains. This man worked for Pharaoh Khufu, the owner of the Great Pyramid. His name is Eri. Eri was the high priest of Khufu and would be the overseer of Khufu's tomb, the Great Pyramid, once Khufu had died. The ancient Egyptians had such a firm belief that your spirit would ascend into the sky like a bird and meet with Osiris, the god of the afterlife.
Osiris had a counterpart god known as Ptah. And when these two gods were combined, they created an all-powerful god. that would be worshipped all the way from Egypt to Rome. In 117 AD, Emperor Hadrian was ruling Rome. At his villa in Tivoli, Hadrian had an Egyptian Serapium created. This space was dedicated to Osiris, Apis and Ptah. These Egyptian statues made with a Roman flair, such as the Staff of Ptah with a rooster. Serapis was the combination of Ptah, Osiris, and the Apis bull. When Hadrian's lover Antinous died, he was named Osiris Antinous, connecting him with Serapis. The worship of Serapis and the Apis bull have long-standing roots in ancient Egypt. The Serapium of Hadrian and Antinous is a beautiful combination of Roman and Egyptian art and religion. By Hadrian's time, Rome had been ruling Egypt for over a hundred years. Antinous was sort of named as pharaoh in Egypt, and when he died, Hadrian named an entire city after him. The mighty emperors of Rome could not be overcome by the religion of Egypt. A Roman was so taken with the religion of ancient Egypt that he built the Serapium to his favorite Antinous, where he worshipped him as an Egyptian god. Some scholars believe that Hadrian had Antinous buried in his Serapium in Italy. It is believed that over 100 statues were dedicated to Antinous by Hadrian. This is Antinous, the favorite lover of Emperor Hadrian, and he was actually crowned sort of as pharaoh in Egypt. And unfortunately, he drowned in the Nile which caused Emperor Hadrian to build the city of Antinopolis. But this is a representation of Antinous as a pharaoh, but in a very Roman style. The ancient Egyptian jackal-headed god, Anubis, the leader of the dead, shown here in a very Roman style, wearing a very Roman draped tunic and sandals. In the first century AD in Rome, Anubis was connected to Mercury. Two winged serpents intertwining on his staff, known as the Caduceus, symbolizing his connection to the Roman ferryman of the dead. It was not uncommon for Romans to adopt and adapt ancient gods from other religions. Thoth could be associated with Hermes or Mercury. And the Egyptian Nile god Hapi, given a Roman makeover into a fountain. A thousand years before Hapi's makeover, Egypt was ruled by one of its most powerful pharaohs conquering vast lands and building on an unprecedented scale. However, strangely, at the Vatican, very few artifacts are on display of Ramses II, but rather a woman that is responsible for Ramses' entire life. A lady that I've been waiting so long to meet Mut Toy, the mother of Ramses II. Statues of queens are usually smaller, unless we think of Queen T or Nefertari. This woman was so amazing, and she's the one who trained Queen Nefertari. 
And what I love about her statue, she's so huge, Ramses' name is at the top. Ramses had several statues dedicated to his mother across Egypt, from Abu Simbel to Memphis, but this one was found at the Ramesseum in Luxor. And at the bottom here, we have Ramses' sister and her daughter. Because the statue was damaged when taken to Rome by Emperor Caligula, Hinumitra, Ramses' sister on the side, has been given a Roman skirt. Ramses venerated his mother, as to be reborn in the afterlife, you need a mother. She was the great royal wife of Pharaoh Seti I and played an important role in Egyptian politics. It is absolutely incredible to see this amazing woman. Next on our lineup are the descendants of a Greek man who called himself the son of Amun. In 332 BC, the Persians had taken over Egypt. Egypt's salvation would come from a mighty Greek Macedonian conqueror. Alexandros, better known as Alexander the Great. A descendant of Alexander the Great, Ptolemy I became Pharaoh of Egypt when Alexander died. When his son, Ptolemy II, came to the throne, he had a co-regency with his sister wife, Arsinoe. And this woman was given an unprecedented title at the time. Arsinoe was named ruler of Upper and Lower Egypt, making her a full pharaoh. When she died in year 15 of Ptolemy II's reign, he decreed that Arsinoe be deified and her statue placed in every temple. The Apis bull was connected to the strength of the pharaoh and was worshipped up and down the land. One specific bull was chosen and placed inside the temple. When the bull died, it would be mummified as a pharaoh and celebrated throughout the land of Egypt. What we have here is one of the only depictions of the Apis bull as a man. So it's the Apis bull with the head, with the horns, holding the staff of Waz, and he is with the body of a man. Isn't he just beautiful? Not surprisingly, the Vatican holds many rare Egyptian statues of gods. A rarely seen statue of the goddess Selkit. She has the body of a scorpion and the head of a goddess. She would protect you from bites and poison, usually just shown as a woman. And this, an Egyptian cobra, Uraeus, usually shown at the front of a pharaoh's crown inlaid with stone and gilded with gold. Snakes, birds, bugs, the Egyptians also worshipped several forms of felines. Not very often do we get a depiction of a male lion god in Egypt, apart from one, and his name was Mahes. Mahes is shown here in such a small depiction of a strong male lion, the god of war and destroying your enemies. And Ramses II showed Mahes very rarely, but at places like Wadi al Sabua, which is the Valley of the Lions, which is where the lions were trained 
to be taken to war with Ramses and Ramses own pet lion that we see depicted with him at Abu Simbel during the Battle of Kadesh is called Mahes, the destroyer of the enemies. And here he is. Usually a lion is not shown as a god. A lioness is the female goddess. Sekhmet is shown as a goddess, but never a male lion. This is an extremely rare image of Mahes, the male god of war. The Vatican is well known for having many Christian and Catholic artifacts, but they also have a huge collection of Egyptian art. And one of the most famous pieces that they have is this lion of Nectanebo, which was found at Philae. Unfortunately, it would be Christianity that would bring ancient Egypt to its final demise. Philae Temple is the last place where ancient Egyptian religion was practiced. The Roman Empire then came into Egypt, but many of the emperors depicted themselves here at Philae as pharaohs. This lion has been copied so many times in Europe when it was brought to Rome even walking around Naples in Italy, you will find many ancient copies of the Nectarnebo lion. It's actually so famous you would have recognized it from being on fountains, outside people's homes. So this lion has actually traveled through thousands of years. So there we have it. Those are some of the mysteries and treasures held at one of Catholics and Christians most sacred sites. Priceless pieces of art gathered vastly from the ancient world. From kings pharaohs, emperors, and popes. These are just a few of the Egyptian secrets at the Vatican. This is Pompeii, an ancient city practically frozen in time. It is so unique that walking on the streets here makes you feel transported back almost 2,000 years ago to when it was one of the most populous cities in the ancient Roman Empire, not only for people from Italy, but also the Greeks and even as far as Egypt. As an Egyptologist and a history lover, I want to see what links there are between Pompeii and Egypt. And trust me, there are quite a few. Many of us are very familiar with the final days of Pompeii and how it became to be so perfectly preserved. In 
in case you didn't know, Pompeii was devastated by a volcanic eruption from Mount Vesuvius in year 79. But what about before that? So much is known about Pompeii's end, but what about their beginnings? In fact, Pompeii suffered from several natural disasters before its ultimate fate. In the year 62 and 63, they experienced small earthquakes and a minor eruption, events that made their faith in the gods even stronger. And led them to become even more devoted to prevent this from happening again. If you ask me, I would have left the second I saw smoke coming out of that mountain. Ironically, while they were still repairing their vast city from the previous damages, the largest eruption finally destroyed them. Only in the mid-1600s, when the volcano erupted again, did modern-day man fully understand what could have caused their demise. Scarily, the most recent eruption was in 1944, So where did Pompeii originate? It's something that we don't really seem to discuss. And it's something that's always interested me. And frankly, I always found the life of Pompeii more interesting than its death. It appears that Pompeii was founded by a group of people from Italy's region of Campania, known as the Oscans. They settled here as a result of the close proximity to the river, ocean, and a sloping mountain, as well as very fertile soil. This was around the 7th century BC. However, there is suggesting evidence that the first settlements here were around the 9th century BC which could make Pompeii almost 3,000 years old. Hi, Cleopatra. Hi, how are you? I'm great, and you? I'm very well, thanks. I'm doing well. <laughs> well, you know, I, I remember a while back when we spoke, you mentioned that you found something that helps prove who founded Pompeii. Can you tell me a little more about that? Yeah, so about five years ago when I was uh, digging at Pompeii, um, I found this piece of pottery with this very rare alphabet on it called New Syrian. And I showed it to my professor and he was very excited. And he said this was one of the most exciting finds from the last decade. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was an amazing moment. Um, and basically it, it shines a light on who actually founded Pompeii, whether it was the Greeks themselves, whether it was Etruscan foundations, or whether it was locals inspired by the Greeks. Yeah. And this, the appearance of this alphabet so early on in Pompeii's history uh, builds the case for the fact that it was actually the locals who um, founded Pompeii. So it was, a bit, it, was, it was a big find, and it was amazing to have had a role in that. That is quite a revelation. I mean, everyone thinks it's either Etruscans or Greeks or Oscans. So here we have a civilization from the local area. That's quite amazing. Yeah, it was, it was, it was an incredible, incredible moment. These early settlements in and around the vicinity of Pompeii were rather small and independent. In the 8th century BC, the Greeks, 
arrived looking for a place to stop over on their oil, wine and goods trading route. They settled in the area, creating their new city. The Greeks then moved to southern Italy, where they founded their Grisha Magna and created this city. Naples, or Neapolis, as it was named by the Greeks, would become the key point for the Greeks to colonize southern Italy, which would later become known as Grisha Magna. Their culture spread through the south as far as Sicily, where they built several cities and temples. Many Greeks from the new city, Neapolis, would now move to Pompeii, which was right across the bay. And that is how the Greek influence started. However, the Etruscans came into Pompeii and their influence was mixed with the Greeks in 700 BC. Then the Samnites arrived in the 5th century. Though an empire just north wanted Pompeii. In 310 BC, Pompeii became an ally of Rome, but was not fully under Roman control. Rome had a huge influence on Pompeii, not only in religion, but architectural style and cultural influences. Finally, in 89 BC, Roman rule was fully in power at Pompeii, and Latin then replaced all languages in Pompeii as its one true official language. A very sophisticated class of people lived here. Their art, architecture, city planning and ideals were quite beautiful. Yes, they loved having a good party, amongst other things. But Pompeii was the city to live in 2,000 years ago. At its height, Pompeii was home to almost 20,000 people. Because of its multicultural inhabitants in and around Pompeii, the city was home to Roman-style villas, Greek-style amphitheaters, and temples with a touch of ancient Egypt. We know that the Greeks had a big influence on Pompeii. With temples dedicated to Dionysus, the Greek god of wine and fertility, Apollo, and Heracles, also known as Hercules. Rome was influenced by Egypt in the second century BC during the reign of Pharaoh Ptolemy VI. And of course, during the famous love affair of Cleopatra and Julius Caesar. At Dindira Temple in Egypt, we can see them together. Cleopatra and Caesar and their son Caesarion. Rome was heavily influenced by ancient Egypt 
around 45 BC. But what of Pompeii? They were already aware of Egypt hundreds of years before Egypt's influence on Rome. My friend Alex, an archaeologist and tour guide who is born in modern Pompeii, wants to show me a villa that he believes will give me the link to prove the connection between Egypt and Pompeii. Alex, there aren't many very in-your-face signs that Pompeii was influenced by ancient Egypt, right? Right, Curtis. We don't have many, but there are a few very pretty ones. Mm -hmm. And let me show you one. Okay, show me. This way. <laughs> Andiamo. <laughs> Curtis, when we were talking before about um, Egyptian influences here in Pompeii, this is the house I was thinking of. Okay. House of the Gilded Cupids. and. It's this, which I wanted you to see. Right here in the house of the Gilded Cupids. Behind of us, we have this amazing shrine, which does clearly recall a lot of Egyptian symbolism. The Apophis snakes, temple implements, and, of course, the gods. We have Anubis, Horus, the little Horus, Isis, and Osiris. But notice, these Egyptian gods are wearing Greek robes, and Osiris has a full beard. But at the same time, notice this great attempt of religious syncretism as the cultures are blending in. Anubis, on his left shoulder, he is holding the caduceus, the staff of God Hermes, God Mercury. In the same house, on the other side, we would have found the traditional Roman shrine with the statues of Zeus, Jupiter for the Romans, Juno, Minerva, the two Laris, the household gods, and Mercury too. Osiris was the god of agriculture and the afterlife. His wife was Isis, and their son was Horus, the reincarnation of the pharaoh. Anubis was the leader of the dead. An Egyptian cobra, along with the temple implements, such as the instrumental sistrum used to evoke the gods. We know of several Greek gods and goddesses who were worshipped at Pompeii. However, many Egyptian deities were revered in the city as well. A great temple to Isis is at Pompeii. The worship of the Egyptian goddess Isis spread throughout the Mediterranean thousands of years ago. Many festivals were held here at Pompeii to Isis, and her followers ranged from slaves to the highest of nobility. We even know that Nile water was specifically brought to Pompeii to be used as holy water during these ceremonies. I, Isis, am the only ruler of time, sole inspector of the limits of the sea and the land. With scepter in hand, the one mistress. In fact, all name me supreme goddess, the greatest of all gods in heaven. For I myself have discovered everything and to calm this toil. The writing will prove it, revealing to all my intentions, which I disclose to you at the fruits of life. I fortify the cities with reverend walls, and to you I have allowed knowledge and skills. Without me, 
nothing has ever come to existence. Neither do the stars move on the same journey without having first received from me their instructions. Nor will the earth bear fruit in spring if I did not approve all. I grant you love and life and good fortune. I've come into Naples to look for more clues. Dispersed throughout the archaeological museum are links between Egypt and Pompeii, if you know where to look. Little known artifacts, and some on a grander scale, proving Egyptians were at Pompeii. Inside the Temple of Isis at Pompeii, we have depictions of many Egyptian gods, such as this one, the god Bes, the god of protecting children and sex. Bes is one of only a few Egyptian gods that were adopted into the Greek and Roman world. The strange-looking creature is a mix between a dwarf and a lion. Even a scene showing the Egyptian god of the dead, the leader of the dead, Anubis. However, he's shown wearing a very Roman cloak, if you would say, and Greek-style sandals. Yet his face is of the Egyptian jackal god, and this was shown in several houses in Pompeii and even found in a private home at Pompeii is a bronze votive statue to Anubis. Many Nihilesque animals are shown at the Temple of Isis as a way to connect the inhabitants of Pompeii to Egypt still. We have an Egyptian lion and of course a sacred ibis, very Egyptianized for this part of the Mediterranean. And even the worship of the Egyptian Apis bull. Because the Temple of Isis was badly affected by the volcanic eruption, many of the scenes have been taken from the temple in Pompeii across the bay into the Naples Archaeological Museum. The Egyptian cobra, Uraeus, also symbolizing the goddess Wajet, is shown throughout the area. During the later New Kingdom in Egypt, Isis was believed to be connected to the cobra as she became the goddess of magic, a reason why Cleopatra was so entertained with the thought of speaking to snakes. Just like in Egypt, the Isis temple at Pompeii had a hierarchy of priests and priestesses. Daily rituals occurred at the temple with offerings being brought to the statue of the goddess. A priest with a scitula full of milk would be present. While the high priest read from the papyrus invoking the goddess. The highest order of priests would be clean-shaven and they would walk around during the ceremonies, spreading incense, as they believed the goddess would manifest within the perfumed smoke. The images show priests holding sistrums, an instrument shaken to evoke the presence of a god, usually shown with the cow goddess Hathor, But the actual sistrums excavated from Pompeii show the face of Isis. The priests are also dressed in very Egyptian costume. These rare ceremonial scenes give us a vivid idea of what religion was like not only in Pompeii, but also within Egypt.
Of course, the most important scene in the temple is the goddess Isis herself, with baby Horus holding his hand up to his chin, a little like Ramses II statues. Isis slowly entertains an Egyptian cobra while the priests surround her with the evocative temple artifacts. And for good measure at her feet, an Egyptian Nile crocodile. These wall paintings only serve a certain purpose. At the center of the temple is the goddess Isis herself. Only the inner clergy of the temple were allowed access to her. The beautiful statue of Isis with her hand out, the one leg forward, just like the Egyptian art. And her hand, you just want to touch it. We aren't aware of any conflict between the Egyptians and the so-called native people of Pompeii. They all appeared to get along quite well. Pompeii was such a mix of cultures, I don't think anyone could judge the other. Cleopatra, why do you think that Pompeii was so accepting of different cultures and different religions? Well, this, this area and this time period has a history of, I mean, it's on the Mediterranean, so these cultures are coming in and out. So it has a long history of so many cultures, so many different people, everything kind of meshing together. So it's, it's no surprise that, um, that you see this kind of amalgamation of all these cultures and this acceptance. Pompeii, just like Roman world, uh, I do strongly believe Romans were pretty tolerant regarding religions. Um, Christianity, we know that became more than a political issue. But Pompeii, starting from its origins, the foundations, founded by the Oscans, local population strongly influenced by the Etruscans. Pompeii was strongly influenced by the Greeks. Um, Pompeii was surrounded by Greek colonies. And when you trade in goods, you trade in culture at the same time. The presence of the Temple of Isis from the second century before Christ, perhaps created by uh, the sailors of Alexandria of Egypt, do show what uh, great melting pot this city would have been. Finally, too, with the arrival of the Romans, which are blending in, it does create this multicultural society. When did the Egyptian influence arrive in Pompeii, though? They could have arrived back in the seventh century BC with the Greeks. As we know, the Egyptians and the Greeks had very close ties with almost little to no conflict at all. In fact, artifacts are dating back from 525 BC from the reign of Pharaoh Zamtik III have been found in Pompeii and neighboring Ercolano. Back in Naples, tucked away in the museum's Egyptian section, the pharaohs leave us even more clues. Artifacts dating from the reign of Pharaoh Zamtik III, such as a fragmented obelisk, and this beautiful basalt table marking the coronation of the pharaoh. You can see his cartouche here, tik. And over here we have a great hieroglyph showing the king striding. This table of Zamtik which was found at a private villa in Pompeii. Was it actually given to the owner of the villa 
or was it taken there after the Pharaoh's death? You see, at the end of Zamtik's rule, the Persians had taken over Egypt, which could have caused many families to want to leave Egypt and go to their allies in Greece, or even Grisha Magma. That could explain how artifacts from Zamtik III ended up in Pompeii. Even a seated Egyptian statue of the pharaoh, Zamtik, with Greek on it. We have the evidence from a short period later on though, that there were in fact immigrants from Egypt arriving in Pompeii. And why not? They had a similar culture and religion. Simatawi, a high official in Egypt during the Persian occupation in 300 BC, could provide a clue. In 332 BC, Simatawi saw the liberation of Egypt from the Persians by one of Macedonia Greeks, greatest conquerors. Alexander the Great. Our Egyptian official wrote down his accounts of the expulsion of the Persians by Alexander. This is the stela of Sematawi after Alexander the Great left his short stay in Egypt. However, he remained pharaoh. Semetawi wrote down his accounts of Alexander defeating the Persians. And shortly after Alexander left Egypt, Semetawi became the high priest of the son of Isis, Horus. His stela was originally placed in Egypt, but it could have been brought here possibly by a family member when they immigrated to Pompeii, as his stela was found here at the Temple of Isis. I say this because we have several homes at Pompeii with a considerable Egyptian influence with Egyptian gods on the walls, or even Egyptian wildlife, such as cobras, ibis birds, and crocodiles. It is entirely possible that someone who came from Egypt had these scenes put on the walls to feel more at home. There have even been sphinxes and shabtis found in private homes in Pompeii like this little one here. A sphinx is an Egyptian symbol, and it's staggering how many were found at Pompeii. Not only guardians, they also symbolize the sun resting on the horizon. The Egyptian god Bess with a female sphinx, all of these found at homes in Pompeii. At the Temple of Isis in Pompeii, we have a statue of the Egyptian Nile god, Hapi. And here, Hapi is not depicted in the usual Greek-Roman style that we see the Egyptian art adapted to in Pompeii. Here, Hapi is shown as fully Egyptian. Hundreds of these uniquely Egyptian Shabti figurines were found in private homes and buried around the Temple of Isis.
Isis, giver of life, residing in the sacred mount, the lady of Vega at Hilei, she, the one who pours out the inundation, that makes all people live and green plants grow, to provide divine offerings for the gods and invocation offerings for Osiris. For she's the lady of heaven. Her man is the lord of the next world, the pure water rejuvenating himself at Philae in his time. Her son is lord of the land. Indeed, she's the lady of heaven and a new world. She who brought them into existence through what her heart can see and her hands created. She's the soul that is in every city, watching over her son Horus and her love, Osiris. The House of Fawn in Pompeii could provide us with the link we need to prove that the ancient Egyptians had immigrated to Pompeii. In the villa's garden, several sphinxes were found. A sphinx as we know is an Egyptian symbol. Archaeologists are not entirely certain of the origins of the owners of the House of Fawn, but certain evidence does lead us to one conclusion. House of Fawn has some of the most beautiful mosaics, including some very Egyptian style scenes, like this one showing the Nile. Here we see some of the plants from the Nile, such as the palm tree. We see Egyptian geese, a cobra, papyrus, a hippo, a crocodile, lotus flowers, and bird life from the Nile, such as the sacred ibis. This scene shows life happening on the Nile. This sort of scene does not happen in Italy, nor in Pompeii. This scene is very blatantly Egyptian. Were the inhabitants from this house in Pompeii actually from Egypt? More than likely, yes. And this, a five and a half meter mosaic created out of one and a half million cut tiles. It is Alexander the Great chasing the Persians out of Egypt, dating from around 120 BC, over 100 years since the battle actually took place. But why was this shown in a private villa in Pompeii? We know that Alexander never visited Pompeii. So why was this scene shown here, along with other Egyptian-style scenes? Since the Greek influence was so strong in Pompeii, as well as the Egyptian influence, the image of a Greek freeing Egypt from the Persians was seen as the ultimate symbol of power.
And that is why we have this beautiful scene of Alexander the Great in Pompeii, represented in Egypt. could only feel the fires of love, driver. You would hurry more to enjoy the pleasures of Venus. I love young Charmer. Please, spur on the horses. Let's go on. You've had your drink. Let's go. Take the reins and crack the whip. Take me to Pompeii, where my sweet love lives. The people here worshipped Isis and Osiris as they believed they could grant them eternal life. And in a way, they did. For if we speak about them, they are still with us to today. I've come here to Berlin to see the Neues Museum and to discover their vast ancient Egyptian collection. Won't you come with me? From the famous Nefertiti to Queen T, this museum in the center of Europe contains 5,000 years worth of treasures from the pharaohs. From tyrannical rulers to religious zealots and everything in between. The glory of ancient Egypt is here for all to see. However, many would say that these treasures are ill-gotten gains and spoils of war. It wasn't too long ago that these artifacts faced near annihilation. You can see here, I have an image of this exact room when it was bombed in World War II. This is incredible. The museum was bombed and hundreds of ancient art pieces were destroyed. Irreplaceable, they were lost for forever. Weeks later, brave civilians arrived on the scene and volunteered their time to clean up this precious museum. This haunting image shows men rescuing a bust of Tutankhamun from the rubble. A sanctuary for art became the worst place on earth. Yet many things have changed, and today Berlin stands high after its fall. Today the museum's island is a gem of Europe. And this courtyard here, with the sun coming through, to feel a little bit more connected to nature. This courtyard was painted in the 1800s, but blown up during World War II. And there's something quite beautiful and very sad about this room. It's almost a monument to the war, to all the wars of ancient Egypt, of Germany, of the world, because They've left this room untouched, where the paint has chipped off. They've left it. There's still bullet marks in some of the pieces, the Egyptian pieces. 
it's very, very touching to see. This museum focuses on the ancient, with decoration only to enhance the artifacts. Here at the Neues Museum in Berlin, what is so beautiful is the ceiling. It looks original, but that's because it's so damaged. These frescoes were made in the 1800s, painstakingly made to look original. And then, when this museum was bombed in World War II, they decided when they renovated the museum to not fix it. So that's why we have these ceilings. Copied from tombs and temples, this ceiling is filled with astrological signs followed by the ancient Egyptians. The sun, the moon and the stars played a big part for the Egyptians, and each temple had a chief astronomer. And each pharaoh valued their astronomer, dating all the way back to the time of the pyramids over 4,500 years ago. Astronomy allowed for the alignment of the pyramids, and dotted around the pharaoh's tombs were hundreds of tombs for their nobles. Four thousand five hundred years later, some of these tombs can now be marveled at in Berlin. This tomb belonged to two men, one the mayor of Memphis, and the other the overseer of the mortuary temple of the pharaoh. Mehen and Neferbal Ptah, they were nobles that lived during the time of Pharaoh Khufu, during the fourth dynasty, while the Great Pyramid was being built. Here we see Neferbal Ptah holding the staff to show that he's a nobleman in full color. And as we go down, we see Neferbal Ptah with his hand up, showing that he can write. He's about to start writing something on a wall. And up here is his boss's name, Khufu, the owner of the Great Pyramid. And this entire mastaba was taken from Giza and brought here to Berlin. Khufu had many of his loyal followers buried close by around his pyramid. This is Merib, the commander of the troops during Pharaoh Khufu's reign. We see Merib here as he's entering his tomb his name written here, Merib, with the heart scarab as his name ending with the B. And here we can see Khufu's cartouche, ka u -fu. It's just incredible to think that this is from the time of the Great Pyramid. That's around 4,300 years old. It is absolutely mind-blowing. In the doorway we see a family scene of Merib, his son, daughter, and his wife welcoming the body into the tomb. Ah, and here is Merib, the commander of the troops for Pharaoh Khufu, and his beautiful wife, dressed in the traditional fourth dynasty dress with the breasts exposed and a high-waisted skirt. I wonder how they brought this all the way from Giza to Berlin. The fourth dynasty was one of the highest points. However, after the death of Khufu, many family quarrels would cause many issues, including the end of a dynasty. The fifth dynasty consisted of nine pharaohs ruling for over 150 years. These pharaohs continued the tradition of building pyramids for their afterlife. Egypt was not much of a desert land as it is today. 4,500 years ago, it was more of a savanna landscape filled with antelope and wild animals. Still, the everyday people lived along the strip of fertile soil 
along the Nile. For the beginning of the 5th dynasty, the land was prosperous, yet after a while, it began to decline. This scribe, named Henka, lived during the 5th dynasty, but was the high priest and the overseer of the pyramids of Snefru from the 4th dynasty. People who were close to the pharaoh were greatly rewarded during this period. Shown with his wife and child, this nobleman from the 5th dynasty, from the reign of the first pharaoh of this dynasty, Userkaf, would have witnessed a dramatic change in politics from the 4th dynasty to the 5th dynasty. The succeeding pharaoh raised the 5th dynasty to its high point. He increased Egypt's trade and military presence. Pharaoh Sahura, the king that would lead expeditions into Punt, Assyria, Byblos, and Libya, deified in his pyramid at Abusir. Taken from the pyramid temple for King Sahura, this amazing scene shows very interesting gods that we don't usually see depicted in this kind of form. We have the god Geb, the god of the earth, and he's shown here with a full beard and the two feathers of Amun. And before Geb, we have this rather strange looking creature. He is the god of chaos and disorder and destruction. His name is Set. And above, we can see that these two gods are helping Pharaoh Sahura in the fifth dynasty to capture his enemies. But what's interesting is there are enemies that are Egyptian as well. You can see very clearly Egyptian and a man from Libya shown with a uraeus on his forehead. These are all very close countries and they would have been a cross connection of cultures throughout many millennia. So it is very possible that these might not be Egyptian enemies, they might be foreign enemies imitating the Egyptians. After Sahura's rule, we see the country suffering from an immense drought. The Egyptian way of life was under threat, with increasing pressure from neighboring countries. The penultimate ruler of the 5th dynasty, Jed Kara, his skeleton was found inside his pyramid. He reformed Egypt's political standing and mentioned for the first time Nubia, which he conquered to the south. His success followed over into the new set of rulers, the 6th dynasty. A scene from a 6th dynasty tomb wall. They've brought the entire Mastaba again here to Berlin. But what is so interesting is here we see the initial outlines. This is an unfinished tomb. These are the artist's impressions to show the sculptors how to come and chisel out these elaborate embossed carvings. It's just beautiful. So it's as if someone was chipping away, the dead person was brought in and they went, okay, we're done. During the 6th dynasty, the leaving of food and goods offerings became more important. For those like this nobleman who could afford it, they could have real offerings placed in the tomb, but as a backup, many times on the walls, they had offerings carved for eternity. A false door was often placed inside a separate room in the tomb, which allowed for the family of the deceased to come in and leave offerings, and the spirit of the deceased to come in and out to receive them. Nearing the end of this dynasty, a king who lived into his 90s, named Pepi II, rose to power. But his age and length of rule would bring about many problems within the kingdom.
This is a beautiful vase painted with the famous Egyptian blue from the time of King Pepi II, Ka Nefera, his name is on here. But what I'm very interested in is this strange looking wooden piece. It's been eaten by termites and very badly damaged, but it would have been a big, a massive representation of a falcon covered in these beautiful blue faience tiles decorated to look like feathers. Because of the extended age of dear old Pepe II, many regional rulers took it upon themselves to take power, meaning the rise of non-monarchs, or nomarchs. Of course, when the country's economy went down, so did its belief in funerary offerings. Instead of having elaborately carved tomb walls or expensive offerings placed in the tomb, these statues would be there almost to provide the service for eternal life of bringing in your offerings. The country was divided within several ruling regions up and down the land, each man thinking he was more powerful than the next. A ruler named Anktifi helped secure Thebes. Following him, a man named Montehotep came along and reunited Upper and Lower Egypt, starting the Middle Kingdom. A typical 12th dynasty scene of a woman wearing the typical 12th dynasty dress with the breasts exposed, carrying offerings on top of her head. They might not actually be offerings, they might be scenes from everyday life. Egyptian woman putting bread or vegetables from the market and taking it home. The tradition of offering statues continued all the way into the Middle Kingdom. The Middle Kingdom is one of the most interesting times in ancient Egypt's history. It gives us some of the most gorgeous examples of funerary practices, like this painted wooden coffin with the goddess Isis with her wings stretched out. What's sad is, this is a coffin for a child. Rulers may have changed, but mortality had not. And yet again, more of a tomb from the Old Kingdom here in Berlin with his false wall, well, his false door, with the deceased person coming out to greet the offerings arriving from his family. The ancients were not oblivious to the fact that also the family would be deceased at some point in the future. Therefore, they had many of the family members depicted in their tomb. This was a practice going all the way back to the Old Kingdom, almost like the mysterious reserve heads, which were probably a backup for the deceased in case their body was lost. On this offering table, known as a hetep, we see them bringing in the sacred oils. The Middle Kingdom was an interesting time, and modern scholars actually refer to this period as the classical period of ancient Egypt, due to the fact of many personal narrative papyri that were found. You see, the parallels between the Old Kingdom and the Middle Kingdom are quite slight. Priests like Ankaf from the Sixth Dynasty in the Old Kingdom would write down their personal stories holding a staff with his full figure showing his prosperity. In the Cairo Museum, we have an excellent example of a mayor and priest with a full body holding a staff from the fourth dynasty known as Ka'ape.
the connection between Lord Carnarvon and Howard Carter is spread throughout all Egyptian museums. The impact is, is so strong. These pieces were found by Howard Carter and donated to this museum, pretty similar to the museum in Florence and all over the world where we find pieces discovered by Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon. It is often the smaller pieces that can tell us more about real life than the grand monuments, like this 12th dynasty Cobra Uraeus. Jewelry in the 12th dynasty is some of the most beautiful and delicately executed of all history. What I'm looking at here is some jewelry from the 12th dynasty around the time of Queen Sobek Neferu and Sesostris III. And over there is a little shell. And that shell we can see often during the 12th dynasty. The 12th dynasty saw large amounts of gold flooding into Egypt since the pharaohs invaded Nubia and started more trade routes to the south. Furniture in the Middle Kingdom is some of my favorites, including these cosmetic boxes with ebony and ivory flower handles. Cosmetics have always played a large part in Egyptian history, and they come in a variety of shapes, sizes, and forms, just like today. And accessories were not just for men or for women. Eyeliner was worn by everybody, as was jewelry. This Middle Kingdom pictorial necklace, worn in everyday life, was then placed on the mummy with a scarab in the center representing their heart. This time in history provided us with so much drama, fantastic pharaohs, and tyrannical rulers. This pharaoh was a co-regent with his father and ruled the country for over 45 years. Amunemhat III, the father of Sobek Neferu, the father of the first ever recorded female pharaoh. And he's so beautiful. He's done in this 12th dynasty style. And you can see he's got those frown lines, pretty similar to Sesostris III. Amunemhat III, saw the Middle Kingdom reach its zenith. Unlike his father, he ruled Egypt relatively peacefully. He had two pyramids constructed for himself. In one pyramid, himself, his daughter Sobek Neferu, and the 13th dynasty pharaoh Horawebra were interred. How did his reign of peace come about? Amunemhat I, the son of Sesostris I, a king who would have a long line of prosperous successors. Sesostris I pushed Egypt's borders to the north and the south, invading Nubia twice and Canaan on occasion. It's from Sesostris I that we get the tale of Sinaue. The scribe wrote that Sesostris had to be brought back to Egypt during an invasion in Libya after his father, Amunemhat I, had been assassinated. Strong militaristic rulers would follow, such as Amunemhat II and Sesostris II, leading up to the grand ruler of the 12th dynasty, Sesostris III. This ruthless warrior is often shown with a displeased look on his face. Probably considered the most powerful pharaoh of the 12th dynasty, Sesostris III expanded Egypt's borders and kept the enemies at bay by building forts up and down the land. A tale by the Greek Herodotus Lysisostris as the pharaoh that conquered all the way up to Romania. 
setting the boundaries and leading the way for Amunemhat III. The statue has been changed many times over its lifetime, probably created first by Sesostris, then adapted to Amunemhat III. And even on the side, we have the names of Ramses II and his son, the 13th son, Merenbetah. This dynasty is probably considered the classical period, since we get to hear the voices of the everyday people. The 12th dynasty saw a rise in power for nobles and people that served the pharaoh. It was not uncommon for noble families during the 12th dynasty to have butlers, as many similar butler statues have been found. He asks for offering of bread, beer and fowl on the side of his statue, so Beknihotep is his name. This is the High Stuart during the 12th dynasty in the reign of Sesostris III. And he's shown in this full cloak. As we know, it can get pretty cold in the desert at night. Apart from having a practical use, these cloaks often served ritual purposes and were worn on special occasions. Like Sesostris wearing his cloak at his jubilee. Yet the long success of the 12th dynasty came crashing down. The men and women of ancient Egypt, who were going about their lives as anyone would today, were now faced with the second intermediate period. A female pharaoh known as Sobek Neferu was the last pharaoh of the 12th dynasty. Having no heirs upon her death, there became a power struggle. The 13th dynasty was formed, creating a list of short-lived rulers. Seeing the lack of power in Egypt, the Hyksos from the north invaded and separated the country again. On his knees, holding out two offering jars, is Pharaoh Sobek Hotep, one of over 30 pharaohs during the 13th dynasty. The country was divided and rulers changed frequently for almost 200 years. These are some of the original frescoes from the 1800s and they've designed these pillars to look like you're inside an Egyptian tomb. And what's amazing, you have the red desert, the sand, and then the black silt of the Nile. And usually a figure would be shown on top of here. And it's beautiful because it sort of looks very authentic. A pharaoh named Ahmosa I defeated the Hyksos and reunited Egypt, forming the 18th dynasty. His son, Amenhotep I, became the second pharaoh of the 18th dynasty, and he expanded Egypt's borders beyond Nubia into Kush and maintained the policies with Libya. Beautiful scene of pharaoh Amenhotep I. This is one of the only times we see the Egyptians mixing colors to get some sort of skin pigmentation rather than the plain red and yellow that is always depicted. He's shown with a beautiful pleated shirt. Amenhotep I developed the religion and gave us the current version of the Book of the Dead which would have been used for millennia after his death. He is seen here in such fine dress, as the people saw him as a hero, as a god, as he was the son of the man that liberated Egypt from the foreigners. But over here is his mother, Ahmosa Nefertari. For a short time, she ruled as co-regent with her son. Now, she's shown with completely black skin, 
And this has caused a lot of controversy recently. A lot of Egyptologists think that the skin color means that she is Nubian, but a lot of Egyptologists say it's representation that she has been deified, that she has been mummified. She's become one with Osiris, who's also sometimes shown with black skin to show rebirth. But she's absolutely beautiful, not to be confused with Nefertari Merit Mut, the wife of Ramses II. Ahmose Nefertari and her son, Amenhotep I, founded the village of Deir al Medina, and because she was the wife of the man that liberated Egypt and the mother of the next pharaoh, she was deified, and therefore her son was deified as well. The worship of these two royals spread for hundreds of years, and even Ramses II is credited with many stela dedicated to Amenhotep I. These two royals were worshipped at Deir al Medina. They founded a village hidden away from the public, where the workmen who built the tombs in the Valley of the Kings would live with their families. And three times a year, a special festival was held to honor them. For hundreds of years, this exclusive festival took place in Deir al Medina, hosted by the families that lived there. A votive statue of Amenhotep I would be carried around the village from door to door, and people who wanted answers to their questions would jump in front of the statue and ask, and the priests would be compelled to lean to a left, right, forward or back, giving the specific answer. This strong woman laid the path for many women in the country to follow. And just a few short years after Ahmose Nefertari, a woman became pharaoh. A kneeling statue of Queen Hatshepsut, showing her piety by giving an offering of beer or wine to the gods. She became pharaoh because her father was a pharaoh and the male heir was too young. There's a lot of speculation about Senenmut and his relationship with Hatshepsut. It's so interesting that we see statues of Senenmut shown as a scribal statue. And he has baby Neferure, the daughter of Hatshepsut. We don't know who the father of Neferure is, but he's shown very close with her. It is unclear whether Neferure was the daughter of Senenmut, or the daughter of Hatshepsut's previous pharaoh husband. Yet it is interesting that Senenmut mentions Neferure in his tomb. Neferure took on the roles of Lady of the Two Lands and the God's Wife when her mother Hatshepsut became pharaoh. Hatshepsut had an exceptionally successful reign. She is famous for leading many expeditions into the land of Punt, where she brought back many botanical treasures. Later in her reign, when he was older, the man that was born to be the next pharaoh became the head of Hatshepsut's army. Tutmosis III finally took the throne when Queen Hatshepsut died. In his time, Tutmosis III expanded Egypt's empire to the largest it had ever seen. Having many years to train in the army while his stepmother ruled the country, Tutmosis III became one of Egypt's most fearsome fighters. I've just seen something I've been waiting so long to see. She's here. Queen T the wife of Amenhotep III. I'm taking her home with me. You know, my friend Diane, she's always asked me this question. If you go to a museum, have a look around and think, if this museum was on fire, what piece would I want to save? I know a lot of you might think Nefertiti in this museum, but for me, 
it's queen t. This wooden bust of Queen T was discovered at Malkata, the palace built for her on the western bank near Luxor. She is actually wearing a crown on this bust, not an afro as many have suggested, as is indicated by the blue lapis beads which would have encrusted the crown. She wears a gold band on her brow and a hole for a cobra and a vulture. Atop her head, she wears the feathers, horns, and sun disk, indicating the goddess Mut. The eyes would have been lined with thick black paint, and she wears one earring with two cobras. Some suggest that Queen T ruled as a co-regent in the early years of her husband Pharaoh's reign. Amenhotep III was an entirely peaceful pharaoh. He was the grandfather of Tutankhamun. This unknown bust is of the most famous pharaoh of them all, King Tut, the son of the heretic king Akhenaten. Incredibly beautiful woman from the late 18th dynasty. Her name is Maya, and she was the nurse for Tutankhamun. And she's shown here with her husband, with their cones of perfume on their head. And at the bottom, here, holding her husband around the chest with elegant little fingers, showing that she loves her husband, who you can see has the traditional Amman and little belly to show that they lived well. And underneath, her cute little pet monkey. It's just incredible to think that this is how people lived. I know these are images to be shown to the gods. It might not be the everyday life, but certainly once a year they would have done something where they dressed up like this. The rich nobles during the late 18th dynasty in the reign of Tutankhamun were treated like kings, but nowhere near on the scale as the next 19th dynasty, the Ramessides. This museum is filled with treasures from the entire history of Egypt, yet one pharaoh remains elusive here, Ramses II, the pharaoh that had more statues and monuments made than any other. Chaim was it, the son, one of the sons of Ramses II. He became high priest of Ptah in Memphis. And there are rumors that he lived below ground in the Serapium at Saqqara. But what I love about this statue of him, he's shown with the side lock, the side lock of youth. And this would be cut off when you became a man, when you turned around age 13. But yet, he's still shown here in a very Ramesside style, as an adult, as a high priest. Family became of the utmost importance during Ramses II's reign. As the statue suggests, we see a man and his two wives with their three children presented before them. Generally, monogamy was practiced in ancient Egypt, apart from the pharaoh who was allowed many wives. But in this case, and in a few special cases, we see men with two wives. However, the woman remained in charge of the family. This is a mask of the Greek king Agamemnon, and many years ago, people confused Agamemnon to be a king of Egypt, and that is how the two colossal statues of Amenhotep III became named the Colossi of Memnon, after this Greek king. Egypt 
Egypt was a possible jewel in the crown for all neighboring countries. It was invaded by the Assyrians. The Nubians chased the Assyrians out, as we see two Nubian men here depicted as Egyptians. However, the Assyrians chased the Nubians back out, and then the native Egyptians took back control, forming the 26th dynasty. This is a beautiful green stone head of Pharaoh Amasis. Amasis II, because he was named Amasis probably about a thousand years after the first Pharaoh, Amasis. Amasis being the Greek version of his name. In ancient Egyptian, his name is Ahmose. However, Amasis is a bit less confusing. Amasis was able to foil the invasion of Egypt from the Babylonians, and Egypt having good ties with Greece was even increased during his reign, as he contributed 1,000 talents of gold to rebuild the Temple of Delphi in Greece. With exquisite detail, this masterpiece of Egyptian art of an unknown man is simply called the Green Head of Berlin. We may not know who he is, but we do know that he lived around the time when Egypt was then ruled by the Greeks who had chased the Persians out of Egypt, known as the Ptolemies. In 332 BC, Alexander the Great liberated Egypt from the Persians and was named Pharaoh. His successors went on to rule Egypt with a mix of Greek and Egyptian culture. The most famous being the final pharaoh of Egypt before she was defeated by the Romans. Resembling images of her coins, this bust is said to be that of the great Cleopatra VII. Shortly after the death of Cleopatra, during the Roman rule, settlements out in the oases of Egypt continued their mummification practices. This set of mummies is an example of a rich family who would export wine to the Mediterranean. Wine was a lucrative business and this allowed for the family to have their death masks made of gold, like the golden father shown with his full beard. The people living in Egypt at this time had a mix of Egyptian, Greek, and Roman funerary customs, exemplified in these lifelike clay death masks made to resemble the deceased. Not often do we actually get examples of Egyptians using different colored eyeliners and eye makeup. Usually it's just black. But here we can see the green pigment. And what's so amazing, this is a woman from the Roman period, and she's shown wearing bracelets of two serpents in a similar style to what we find generally at Pompeii. And on her death mask, her hair has actually been glued into place so that she could be connected to the goddess Hathor to get into the afterlife because one of the the wishes for the ancient Egyptians to get into the afterlife was to be connected with Hathor. And if you were connected with the goddess of beauty and motherhood, well, she would put in a good word for you with Anubis and Osiris and get you fast-tracked because you are beautiful enough to be with the gods. The goddess Hathor was one of the most important deities since the beginning of Egyptian history. On this box from the 19th dynasty, 3,300 years ago, we see a goddess in the tree giving the water of life to a deceased woman and her spirit. Often, the tree goddess was associated with Hathor.
In this time, Hathor is often shown as a cow on the hill of Deir al Medina. In the 19th dynasty, Hathor was referred to as the Lady of the West, the West being the realm of the dead. The father of Ramses II, Egypt's greatest pharaoh, is shown here before Osiris, the god of the afterlife. It was up to Osiris to make the final judgment on whether the deceased could enter heaven. Luckily for a pharaoh, once he had died, he became one with Osiris and was often depicted as the god of the afterlife himself. The art style in this pharaoh's reign Seti I, in my opinion, was the greatest in all of Egypt's history. This pillar was taken from the tomb of Seti I in the 1800s by Giovanni Belzoni, but was never intended for our eyes. During the 19th dynasty, especially at Deir al Medina, we have funerary chapels which were intended to be entered by the deceased's family to come and pay tribute to their ancestors. The divine family, Isis and Osiris, meeting with their son Horus in the chapel. On the main wall of the chapel, we see the wife of the deceased kneeling before him, and a high priest, his son, giving him an offering. The deceased needed to be pious towards Osiris, and here we see the man and his wife kneeling before the god. The god Atu makes a special appearance here as one of the ultimate creator gods. Against a small effigy of the goddess Ma'at of truth and justice, your heart is weighed for its sins by Anubis. Many think that the Egyptians were obsessed with death, but they were obsessed with life and wanting to continue a good life in the next world. But at times it came under threat. Around the 27th dynasty, a lot of different mummification practices were being melded and brought back, discarded. It kept evolving. And here we have such an interesting coffin. We see it was originally painted, but it has been splashed with this black resin, perfumed resin. And this was seemed to have some sort of rejuvenation powers. It's, it's really quite interesting that they would have gone to all the trouble to paint it and then splash it with this, this black resin. Rather than canopic jars, these canopic coffins gilded in gold contain the mummified organs of the deceased covered in the sacred black resin. This resin had various ingredients from frankincense and myrrh to the Egyptian blue lotus. Found in many tombs, the sacred blue lotus to the Egyptians had many properties, but the main symbol for it was rebirth. A thousand years after Pharaoh Pepi II, 3,000 years to us, the glory of the afterlife was under threat. Something very interesting during the Third Intermediate Period, when people couldn't afford to have elaborate tombs and burials made, and even to have their own Book of the Dead made out of papyrus, they had the text written inside their sarcophagus to help them reach the afterlife. It's a very sweet way, but very sad to think that this person could afford a sarcophagus but they couldn't afford the entire package. Burials and mummification came in several different packages, from the most simple to the most elaborate, and all this to appease the hundreds, if not thousands, of the many gods of ancient Egypt. Gods like Amun-Min with his erect penis for fertility, and the goddess Anuket, the protector of the Nile cataracts. 
She was worshipped all the way in the south on Elephantine Island, and later became the goddess of lust. Several other deities were worshipped at Elephantine as well, like the ram-headed god Khnum, often seen as the source of the Nile. He later became associated with the formation and creation of men. He had a temple dedicated by Tutmosis III at Elephantine. Many gods had functions for the Nile, as it was their source of life, and living in the cataracts was one of the most important. What we have over here is a beautiful, beautiful, damaged obviously, statue of the Nile god Hapi. He's here holding the lotus and papyrus, combining Upper and Lower Egypt. And he's shown in a very late 18th dynasty, early 19th dynasty, time of Seti I, Ramses I. And he is just so beautiful. He's shown with his full breasts to show the abundance of the Nile, as well as his large stomach with the folds. Hapi is often shown combining the lotus and the papyrus, upper and lower Egypt. There were many forms of Hapi, such as the traditional full-bodied man. Yet, he did have a feminine counterpart, and she was the goddess of the branches of the Nile Delta. Back in Berlin, I'm going to take you to meet this museum's most famous family. From the world's most overly extorted Egyptian queen, to the heretic pharaoh and son of Queen T. And here he is, <laughs> the heretic pharaoh Akhenaten. This bust was found at the workman's house called Tutmose. The man who created the bust of Nefertiti, he created a second version of that bust, but for the husband, for the pharaoh, Akhenaten. Unfortunately, it's completely damaged, unlike the pretty much intact image that we have of Nefertiti. But this is one of the most lifelike images we will have of this pharaoh. The strange-looking man revolutionized religion and the representation of the royal family to the public. Straying away from the idealized image that all Egyptians desired, Akhenaten went for a new, more realistic art representation. He wanted to show himself, his queen and wife Nefertiti, and his family in an overly exaggerated form of realism, showing their flaws and all. When you look into the eyes of this couple, one can only imagine, was Akhenaten a madman or a master of ancient Egyptian art and religion. This is a beautifully painted fresco from a palace at Amarna. In his new arid city of Akhetaten, this scene would bring the outside to the inside. This new style showing movement and life rather than rigid Egyptian tones was believed to have been taught directly from Akhenaten. Many scenes from this city show unprecedented everyday life. A family stealer from the 18th dynasty under Amenhotep IV, later who changed his name to Akhenaten. And we see a man shown with a full beard and his, his son and his wife sitting enjoying the day and he's drinking beer out of a jar. And he's drinking the beer with a straw that has a bend in it with a filter. And Next to this scene, we have some actual spices and ingredients that went into making this beer. 
would have been a very different tasting beer to anything you guys drink. I don't drink beer, so I wouldn't know. Beer was enjoyed by everybody in ancient Egypt, and it became a staple of their diet. Beer even became a way to pay craftsmen. This is how ancient Egyptian sculpture was made. A big stone block, and it was drawn with lines, and from those lines they had the connecting the connecting features of whatever sculpture they were doing. So in this case, we have an unfinished sphinx. The sculptors were more free during the time of Akhenaten, straying away from the rigidness of Egypt's past. Akhenaten here holding a table for offerings. What we see over here is realism. See, these faces have been cast from real life. And who we see over here is thought to be the father of Nefertiti, Pharaoh I. It was I who would succeed Tutankhamun in becoming the next Pharaoh. But of the many women of the late 18th dynasty, there is one that some believe became a Pharaoh after Akhenaten. A woman who many believe died young, yet this statue suggests otherwise. Nefertiti outlived Akhenaten and became Pharaoh in her own right. If we see, Nefertiti has aged. She has jowls, her breasts have sagged, even a belly, and she's hunched over. The line of succession after Akhenaten is very muddled, yet many believe Nefertiti outlived him and renamed herself as Pharaoh Nefernuaten or Smenkara. And in this courtyard, we have the sun coming through on the statues as Akhenaten and Nefertiti would have intended. Akhenaten favored the sun god Aten, and this room, bathed in the sun rays, is filled with only the images of the royals, Akhenaten, Nefertiti, and their children. What we see is a draft statue of Queen Nefertiti. We know it's a draft statue because of these lines on the bust. Similar to cosmetic surgery, they marked on this statue what they wanted to improve. But this statue shows us what she really looked like. She looks more natural. The lines on the jowls and the cheeks show us where Nefertiti wanted to be more defined. Who knows, maybe she wanted to add them in. Because Nefertiti actually looked like this. Whether she wanted smoothing or defining, Nefertiti remains an icon. And I'm going to meet the ultimate image of the Queen. She was discovered on the 6th of December, 1912. But investigating this statue closer in the museum leaves me indifferent with an uneasy feeling. For you see, many suggest she's not real. There is a real bust of Nefertiti that was displayed in the house of a Nazi for many years before being displayed in the museum. But that all changed in 1945. Hitler was planning his invasion of Berlin. Concerned with World War II, the Egyptians wanted Nefertiti back. He demanded that Nefertiti be taken off display from the museum and had an exact replica made of the statue.
He then ordered that the replica and the original be taken to a bunker in Corinthia where they would be protected from the war. However, this led to confusion as the replica was placed in box 29 and the real in box 34. We do not know which box was brought up from the bunker and therefore when we look into the eye of Nefertiti we might be looking into a fake. That bunker was never reopened. We do not know whether this is the real or the fake Nefertiti. But this leaves me with a question. Will the Germans ever return the real Nefertiti back to Egypt? And there we have it. Those are some of the treasures from this incredible, vast museum here in Berlin, in the center of Europe, you can feel a little closer to ancient Egypt. Who would have thought that in the center of Florence in Italy is a giant part of ancient Egypt? For centuries, thousands of Egyptian artifacts have been scattered throughout the world in some of Europe's best museums and private collections. We investigate the enemies, the queens, the treasures, and a mysterious pharaoh. Priceless treasures from explorers and treasure hunters in the city that drew the men who discovered Tutankhamun together. Come with to see the forgotten treasures of Egypt. Tucked away here in Firenze at the Pitti Palace in the Bobbili Gardens, are ancient relics, some from the 16th century. But come on, the 16th century was just like the other day. I'm more interested in 3,300 year old objects. At the very center of the Bobbili Gardens is one of the oldest objects in Florence on public display, apart from anything in the museum. It is a giant obelisk commissioned by Pharaoh Ramses II. This obelisk hails from a set of twin obelisks from Heliopolis, now near modern-day Cairo. Most Egyptologists are aware of 13 obelisks that were taken to Rome. However, this information is incorrect. There were actually 14. In the first century AD, this obelisk was moved to Rome by Domitian and placed in the Temple of Isis in Campus Martius. Along with other obelisks, it was placed near the Pantheon. The famous Medici family claimed this obelisk for their own personal collection. This nine-ton, six-meter obelisk was taken from Rome and brought to Firenze on an epic four-month journey and finally placed here at the center of the Pitti Palace. Adorned by a modern brass orb, this is a very unique obelisk because at the very pinnacle is the sacred scarab beetle holding up the sun. I'm very fortunate that I can read and understand the glyphs on this obelisk. And what we have is a very special name for the king, his Horus name. This name is indicated by a golden falcon wearing the crowns of Upper and Lower Egypt above a temple containing the pharaoh's name. Here Ramses is called the Strong Bull, followed by his throne name, 
Wusir Mayat Ra Setapen Ra, the son of the sun, his birth name, Ramses, the house of Osiris, the one that pleases Ra and the god's body. Ramses, beloved of Amun and Ra, lord of the city Inu. The other side lists his throne name as well as titles, including the lord of many lands, the one who has overcome his enemies, the one who pleases Atum, the son of the sun, Ramses II, ruler of Upper and Lower Egypt, the justice of the strong bull, topped again by the symbol of the rising sun. The obelisk was connected to the sun god Ra and would catch the first rays of light from the rising sun every morning. Ramses II commissioned the largest number of these monolithic structures hewn from red granite in Aswan. Apart from this treasure from my favorite pharaoh, Florence has many more amazing secrets from ancient Egypt that I want to show to you. Not only is there a giant obelisk, but there is also an obscure museum with an interesting connection to the men who discovered the tomb of Tutankhamun. Harry Burton, Lord Carnarvon, and Howard Carter. We do Egyptology because we love sharing stories from the ancient world. So, it upsets me so much when an organization such as a museum does not want to take part in a documentary which is ultimately going to help promote their museum and promote the importance of history towards the general public. I see museums exploiting these ancient artifacts in a disrespectful manner, whether it be by having music videos being shot there. We saw this at the museum in Turin where we had Mahmoud, an Italian singer, performing in front of sacred statues. In my opinion, distasteful. We see Beyonce sneaking cameras into museums to shoot music videos. We even see the Great Pyramid of Giza being used on a BBC show, lit up with thousands of candles inside the burial chamber. How does this help the story of history when all we're doing is dumbing it down? It is a museum's duty to help promote their pieces and their artifacts while keeping those artifacts safe. And by letting someone come in with a camera, obviously not using a flash or lights or things like that, letting them come in and showcase these pieces will help spread the word and in this day and age where everything's all virtual and TikTok and things like that, I think it is so important that we get back to showing people how important history is. I don't see any difference between a vlog and my documentaries. The only difference is I might put more time in and more effort in, into the production. Now, because I am so passionate about telling you, the viewer, stories about ancient Egypt and sharing knowledge of the ancient world. I'm going undercover to show you some of the most amazing treasures held here in Florence at the Museo Archeologico. Since Florence was founded by Julius Caesar, many of the Egyptian artifacts in this museum were discovered in the 1500s in the remains of ancient Roman villas. This massive oil painting showing Jean-Francois Champollion, the man who deciphered the hieroglyphs from the Rosetta Stone, and Impolito Rossellini, his trusted artistic friend. When these two men met in Tuscany in 1824, they revolutionized Egyptology. In 1828, on an expedition to document the history of Egypt, Rossellini and Champollion returned and donated 2,000 artifacts to this museum. The history of Egypt is even more ancient than we could have imagined. In this museum, the history is laid out in chronological order. 
with some artifacts dating back to over 10,000 years ago, to the pre-dynastic period. These clay pots show boats and bird life, such as flamingos, laying out the foundations for Egyptian art and religion. These pots were placed into simple pit graves, the fundamental beginnings of one of ancient Egypt's most important practices. Ancient Egyptian grave offerings have been around since the pre-dynastic period, since the next life was pretty much like this life, only better. The complex system of offerings began to evolve after time. Early offerings in sandy pit graves were simply placed inside clay pots. When mud brick tombs began to appear, more elaborate offerings for the dead were found. This beautiful wooden statue of a woman delicately decorated with flowers on her blue necklace and her short haircut shows her in everyday life making beer. Such statues from the 5th dynasty would enact the function that they are performing in the afterlife for eternity. For those who could not afford tomb wall inscriptions, these figurines served the same spiritual and functional purpose. Shown here grinding grain down to make flour in order to bake bread was so fundamental to the ancient Egyptians that almost everybody wanted to be buried with thousands of loaves of bread. This was much easier than actually filling your tomb with bread. From the 11th dynasty onwards, they realized that it wasn't enough just to have food offerings to eat. You had to be able to get around in the afterlife. And furthermore, you had to actually get to the afterlife. The spiritual journey to enter heaven was taken by boat. Miniature sailboats with oars and rowers would serve this purpose for the spirit of the deceased. A practice that shifted and morphed into a deeper spiritual meaning hundreds of years later. However, some who were of a more higher class and who were offered tombs on behalf of the pharaoh could have their offerings carved magically onto the walls rather than being left physical offerings, such as the vizier and the mayor of Memphis, Mary. His name written before him and appearing in the typical 5th dynasty costume. This fragment from his tomb shows that he received thousands of offerings, listed here thousands of beer, thousands of linen, thousands of beef, and thousands of geese, all to be taken to the afterlife. This beautiful wine cup found in Almana probably was drunk out of by Pharaoh Akhenaten. It is in the shape of the sacred Egyptian flower, the blue lotus, a symbol that has been around for thousands of years. This woman from the Old Kingdom was the mother of the mayor of Memphis. She is shown sniffing a lotus flower. The ancient Egyptians believed that the scent of the lotus could open the mind. A small glyph of her son shows that he was the mayor. To them, the lotus flower had many meanings. Linked with sexual arousement, both men and women were often shown smelling the lotus. This perfumed flower was linked to the god of beauty and incense, named Nefertem. An abundant number of harem women are shown wearing the lotus on their brow as a way to entice the pharaoh. 
Because Nefertem emerged from the lotus, it became the symbol of rebirth and was depicted in almost every Egyptian tomb and temple. The lotus flower also became the symbol for Upper Egypt. Its symbolism and purpose were vastly variable, and if you try to count how many scenes depict the lotus flower, you will be astounded. We know much about the ancient Egyptians because they chose to write down everything in a sacred script called by the Greeks hieroglyphs, which literally translates to sacred carvings. And their use went from the mundane everyday life to defining their religion. Between the 7th and 11th dynasty, Egypt experienced its Dark Age. Today we call it the First Intermediate Period. Following the long reign of Pharaoh Pepi II, small independent nomarchs began to rise in power. Egypt was divided between smaller states, and so the art began to fail. A sad example is the Stela of Nofret. By the 11th dynasty, things began to pick up again. In Thebes, a smaller known god named Montu, the god of war, began to rise in prevalence. A Theban army general named Montuhotep aimed to reunite Egypt. The overseer of the estates of the god Montu tells us that Egypt's wealth began to rise yet again and funerary offerings became commonplace once more. With Montehotep becoming pharaoh and reuniting Egypt once more, the pouring out of funerary offerings became abundant. And this pharaoh revolutionized Egyptian literature and art. Middle Kingdom style is very distinctive. The man in front shown with his wife behind, holding his shoulder in support. And before them an offering of wine and bread is poured out. This couple who lived at Abydos are probably foreigners because of the different facial features, as well as both of their bodies being painted in a dark red color. Whereas in the Middle Kingdom, men were painted red and women were painted yellow. The 11th dynasty saw a resurgence in beauty, linking back to the 6th dynasty during the reign of Pharaoh Pepi and Merenre. These alabaster cups belonging to Merenre was quite a common drinking vessel during the Old Kingdom Sixth Dynasty. Merenre started showing interest in Nubia in the south, leaving Egypt's borders to the north unprotected. A trend that continued from the Sixth Dynasty all the way to the Twelfth. Don't lose your head over the statue. It is actually a Middle Kingdom statue, probably from Sesostris, but it was reused by Pharaoh Zamtik. Introducing a line of three ruthless warrior pharaohs named Sesostris. Although Sesostris is the Greek version of his name, his real name in ancient Egyptian reads as the man of the goddess Wazret, Sen Wazret. 
Sesostris I was indeed a mighty warrior, spreading Egypt's empire to Nubia, Libya, and creating political ties in the north. What I love here is we see Sesostris in the form of Amu, with the feathers on his head, with the god Montu next to him, Montu identified by the two cobras on his brow, and obviously we can read his name. But what is so interesting is Montu has, on these ropes, he has the enemies, the nine so-called enemies, obviously they had more than nine enemies, but these are the nine major enemies. And they are all tied up here, and we can tell that these are different from cartouches. Around the name, we actually have what is like a city wall. So that is the city, the civilization, that the pharaoh and the god have conquered, and they are tying up here. By the time of the rule of Sesostris II, a period of peace and prosperity spread throughout the land. With building and agricultural focuses in the Fayum Oasis and Sinai, Sesostris II even allowed foreigners to begin to move into certain areas in Egypt. This would have dire consequences by the time of his successor. The infamous tyrannical ruler Sesostris III. Sesostris III reinforced Egypt's power in the south in Nubia, having many military campaigns and building fortresses to protect the borders. However, he began to allow smaller independent regional rulers to have their own say. The internal political system began to crumble. Down the line of the 12th dynasty after Amunemhat IV came Egypt's first female pharaoh. With no clear male heirs to the throne, Sobek Neferu became the pharaoh. With her legacy ending the 12th dynasty, the invaders, the foreigners from the north, known as the Hyksos, took power over Egypt. These foreigners, or Hyksos, took power from the north in their settlement area of Avaris dividing Egypt up once again into its second intermediate period. With several ruling states, north were the Hyksos, in the middle the rulers at Abydos and the Thebans. Even the Nubian Kushites to the south wanted power. The 13th dynasty saw the end of the Pyramid Age. By the 17th dynasty, burial practices became less important. Those who still wanted burial goods during the Second Intermediate Period leave us with these unskilled, self-made carvings. Yet these invaders introduced the Egyptians to their most fantastic invention. An invention that would bring the Egyptians' battle tactics to a new level. The fast and flexible four-spoke horse war chariot. This invention would ultimately lead the Egyptians to reclaiming their country. An independent Egyptian ruler began to fight back. War had broken out throughout Egypt. Sikinin Retau, a local Theban ruler, raised up his army against the Hyksos invasion. However, dying brutally in battle, his son, Ahmos took up arms and defeated the Hyksos, founding the 18th dynasty.
On this touching stela, we can see young Ahmos clutching at his father's leg. And behind the young prince is his trusty pet dog. It is a common misconception that the Egyptians were extreme lovers of cats. They had many forms of pets, including cats. However, cats were never given human names. They were simply referred to as a meow, and a dog could be given any given name. Actually, small felines, such as domestic cats, were seen more for the common people, whereas dogs were seen of a higher class. We know that some pharaohs, such as Tutankhamun and Ramses II, had pet lions. Some people in Egypt even adopted pet monkeys. In some higher class families, we know that they even hired attendants to groom and care for the monkeys. Animals in ancient Egypt were held of a very high regard. Larger, more ferocious felines, such as lions, were deified. This high-class woman is shown before an offering table, and below is her pet monkey eating a fig, and she bears the lotus flower on her head. Such life-filled scenes became commonplace in a village founded by the 18th dynasty pharaoh Amenhotep I son of Ahmosa. A unique village where he and his mother, Ahmosa Nefertari, became gods. The village of Deir el Medina was founded to house the workmen and their families who built the tombs for the royals on the western bank of the Nile. This unique place allows us an interesting look into their everyday lives. We might think of furniture as something modern, but here, in this display case, we have examples from Deir al Medina with such amazing details that we think of as modern, such as window shutters. Here we have window shutters from 3,400 years ago, from the village that Amenhotep I founded, Deir el Medina. We are incredibly lucky that much of the furniture from Deir el Medina remains. From exquisite day beds, to the baskets that they would carry livestock in, to small objects like this fly swatter to provide a different kind of comfort, and the chair of a noble with the legs of a lion. The people of Deir al Medina lived in relatively more comfortable situations than the general public, as they served the pharaoh and the royal family directly. Many of the pieces from Deir al Medina were found by Champollion and Rossolini. However, some of the pieces were found by the founder of the Egyptian section of the Archaeological Museum, Ernesto Scaparelli. He found many pieces that are familiar to us today, like dice, a tomb worker's satchel, and a delicate woman's handbag. Party life at Deir al-Medina was filled with the sounds of harps, flutes, lyres, and percussion. Amenhotep I brought about a new age in funerary practices. This mummified form of the pharaoh inside a stone sarcophagus would do his work in the afterlife. These new forms go back to the tradition of funerary figurines. As now the Egyptians believed you needed to do the work yourself, these figurines could be woken up and made to do the job for you. Along with papyrus and wall inscriptions, these figurines would assist you to make your next life more comfortable. They would only place one of these inside your tomb as your double, hence why they are in the form of your mummy. 
This early 18th dynasty practice was short-lived and soon replaced by hundreds of figurines inside the tomb to do your bidding. These servants of the dead were called Shabtis. Each Shabti had a specific role written out on its body in sacred magical texts. Neferenpet, a vizier in the early 18th dynasty, had this Shabti wearing a special ceremonial cloak in the form of himself placed in his final resting place. The tomb in the 18th dynasty became the House of Eternity. A short-lived practice was having the owners of the tomb carved onto the wall, greeting their mummified body as it arrived during the funeral. Home and tomb paintings became very elaborate around the reign of Tutmosis III. This style could be seen due to an influx of people from other countries bringing tribute to Egypt. These pattern textiles from the foreigners had a big artistic influence. A tomb fragment from the time of Tutmosis III shows a bald man with a full beard, very un-Egyptian. He is most likely from the land of Amuru. During this time, gifts flowed in from all around Egypt, as its empire had largely expanded. Copper from Assyria, gold from Nubia, silver from Greece, and ivory from Punt. In tombs such as these, the differences between the cultures are very noticeable, yet the similarities shine through. A young Egyptian boy held by the arm, and a Nubian boy held in the same position by his father. In life, some women of a higher class could have attendants helping them to fulfill their every wish. From preparing meals to helping with hair and makeup, Egyptian servants were well respected and in many cases became part of the family. Female servants were given clothing, housing and many other benefits. You see, in ancient Egypt, women had many more equal rights than any other civilization. Then or now. These ancient women were allowed to work, make decisions about the family, inherit, own property, and marry whomever so they wished. Monogamy was generally practiced by everyday people in Egypt, apart from the pharaoh who was allowed to have multiple wives. There are the odd exceptions, such as the scribe Humasha, who had his two wives shown on this marriage statue. This rare statue shows his two wives, their five children, their two grown-up daughters, and their two grandchildren. In the 18th and 19th dynasty, marriage statues became common practice. Usually, a marriage statue shows a couple holding each other by the waist. However, this is a supportive statue showing the whole family holding each other by the shoulders. Just like today, not all marriages end happily. Tui, the wife of the treasurer of Amun, had her husband deliberately chiseled out of their marriage statue. Women and men in ancient Egypt were allowed to divorce on grounds of many causes, from adultery to theft. If you got divorced, it was customary to have the spouse who had wronged you 
removed from any statue or image. Cutting a mark on the face, such as the eyes, nose, or mouth, would take away the person's spirit that was attached to that image. Not all objects in a museum need to be on a grand scale to be classified as a masterpiece. This woman is one of my absolute favorites. Although much of her is missing, such as her arms, inlaid eyes, nose, mouth, and clip-on linen, the carving on this 18th dynasty woman is exquisite. Spanning from pre-dynastic times until the late period, concubines of the dead were small female figurines placed in men's tombs to fulfill sexual and reproductive needs in the next life. The time of conceiving children and giving birth was some of the most interesting and dangerous times to the ancient Egyptians. Protecting the female fertility was paramount. These strange ivory boomerang-shaped objects were crucial during childbirth. In essence, they were a magic wand to draw a protective spell around the pregnant woman. The hippo goddess Tawaret became the protector of feminine pregnancy. Many women sought out Tawaret to help them conceive and protect their birth. A blue faience hippo in the form of Tawaret, decorated with Nile plant life, is a reminder of the ferocious energy a female hippo uses to protect her young. The principal wife of Tutmosis III, Meret Ra, is often shown in the guise of the goddess Hathor, the goddess of love, beauty, music, and motherhood. This unusual stela shows Meret Ra and Tutmosis III on the right appearing as the god Amun Min, Min being the representative of male fertility and virility. With his erect, circumcised penis shown together, these two symbolically represent the prosperity of the land. Under Tutmosis III, Hathor gained a high prevalence. Many people were shown in the process of becoming one with Hathor, applying makeup. A great thing is that we have some of these mirrors that we see shown in the tombs to provide us with an even stronger connection to these people. We even have their eyeliner that they used to use in everyday life. But looking good wasn't enough. You had to smell good too. And everybody in ancient Egypt desired perfume. Certain smells and certain cosmetics were connected with different events and different deities. This cosmetic box belonged to an old man who had different eyeliners inside each vial for a different purpose. Cosmetics in Egypt were big business. The richest people had the most luxurious cosmetics, including many different types of perfumes and face creams. The poorer people simply used coal to apply to the eyes. Not all of Florence's Egyptian secrets are ancient. Some modern ones are in plain sight at some of the city's most famous monuments. It was here on the famous Ponte Vecchio that Lord Carnarvon and Howard Carter rented an apartment where they would stay on their travels to Egypt. We aren't sure which one of these is theirs, but it's definitely one of them. 
The position was perfect, nearby the Egyptian Museum where they had donated several artifacts, and nearby their photographer friend, Harry Burton, who, as a matter of fact, lived right over here. It was on this street that Harry Burton and his wife, Minnie, lived. And actually, in this house right here, many visits took place between Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon. Visits a hundred years ago that would make history. Harry Burton moved to Italy in 1896, where he began to work as a photographer at the Museo Archeologico. There, he met the rich American Theodore Davies, who funded many archeological digs in Egypt. A bombastic man that forced many of his discoveries took Harry along to capture the moment. From there, he managed to meet Howard Carter. The self-taught Egyptologist had already been working in Egypt for many years, even working alongside Theodore Davies. But luckily, Carter met Lord Carnarvon, who funded his excavations. And from that, they had their most important discovery. Funded by Lord Carnarvon on the 4th of November 1922 at Howard Carter's excavation, a young water boy found the steps into the tomb of Tutankhamun. During that discovery, Harry Burton took his most famous photographs. Using large glass plate photography, Harry Burton faced his biggest challenge. His unique images would capture the world's imagination and begin the phenomena of Egyptomania. Captured faithfully by Harry Burton, a year and a half after they discovered the tomb, they saw the golden sarcophagus of the king. It was not until the 28th of October, 1925, that they finally laid their eyes on the most beautiful piece in Egyptian art, the golden death mask of Tutankhamun. And we have these marvelous images from a chance meeting at the museum in Florence. Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon had made many discoveries. Unfortunately, these were never as famous as Tutankhamun. Their excavations reveal some of the finest details in Egyptian objects. In 1903, Howard Carter began to re-excavate Tomb 20 in the Valley of the Kings. The tomb that was reused by female pharaoh Hatshepsut after her father. The same year, Howard Carter discovered KV-60, the supposed final resting place of Queen Hatshepsut. Both of these tombs were filled with various debris from grave goods, all pertaining to Hatshepsut. When Hatshepsut's husband died, there was a gap because the next pharaoh was too young. She claimed the throne and became full pharaoh. Although Hatshepsut's reign was fairly successful, her successor, Tutmosis III, did his best to take her name out of history. But looking upon the items from her tomb, today we can still remember the great female pharaoh, Hatshepsut. This pharaoh led many trade campaigns, particularly to the land of Punt, where she acquired the myrrh incense she needed to create her favorite perfume. Punt, the land believed to be modern-day Eritrea or Ethiopia, provided an array of botanical goods to enrich Egypt. Her expeditions to Punt were well documented in her mortuary temple at Deir al-Bahri, a place well documented by Howard Carter. In the early 1900s, Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon discovered the tomb 
of Queen Hatshepsut. Unfortunately, all of the pieces in the tomb have been taken out during grave robbings. However, some very interesting pieces remain that were of no interest to grave robbers, such as these little incredible wooden figurines of farm implements like wheelbarrows and pickaxes, and everyday items like a knife, reed mats, and baskets. What we have here is Hatshepsut's perfume. Well, the most amazing thing is the perfume is still inside the bottle. And these are just some of the pieces that Howard Carter, Lord Carnarvon, donated to this museum. Howard Carter, a man who barely finished school and who received all of his archaeological and Egyptological training in the field, is now seen as one of the most important Egyptologists in history and one of the most educated Egyptologists in history. An unknown fact is that Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon had found many tombs and unexplored places before they had found the tomb of Tutankhamun. And a lot of these pieces were then donated to some of their favorite museums around the world, including the museum in Florence. Just three pharaohs down the line from Hatshepsut, we meet one of Egypt's most peaceful and respected rulers, Amenhotep III. Much of his warfare was done through words. And it's through these words of Amenhotep III that we know much about his policies and life. Queen T, the great royal wife of Amenhotep III, the wife whose wedding he bragged about to the entire land of Egypt. Many international policies were made directly through this woman. She had a firm grip on Egypt, even after the death of her husband. A powerful woman unlike any other, grandmother to Tutankhamun and mother to the heretic pharaoh Akhenaten. Ptahmos, meaning born of the god Ptah, was the chief tax keeper under the reign of Amenhotep III. This statue shows Ptahmos holding an offering table for tributes and taxes. The side indicates that the statue was commissioned by his son, Hedge. This statue was found in Thebes in 1791 and is one of the most elaborately carved statues from the period, from his kilt to his fingers to his elaborately decorated wig, eye makeup and pierced ears, even his small details of his shirt. On the shoulder of his dress is the name of Amenhotep. Many have thought that he was the same Ptahmos that was the vizier succeeded by Ramosa. However, evidence from Ptahmos's tomb, the vizier's tomb, and his stela prove that the tax keeper and him are not the same person. His predecessor was Meri Ra, who was also given the title of the one who cares for the king's personal belongings, which means it's the same job that Ptahmos would have done. He was promoted to this position in year 30 of the king's reign. His job was to collect taxes, set the tariffs, and meet with foreign dignitaries. an 18th dynasty man holding one of the highest ranks for an official during the reign of Amenhotep III was named Hui. Hui was the son of the mayor of Memphis and the brother of the vizier Ramosa. This stela shows Hui on the right and his son Ipi 
on the left, Ippi succeeded him in being the high steward under the reign of the new pharaoh, Akhenaten. Another man named Patamos from the reign of Amenhotep III, yet this man was not the tax inspector. He was the high priest of the Memphite god Ptah. The complex god Ptah was mainly worshipped in the north of Egypt. His origins dating back to the Old Kingdom, he served many purposes, including master of the architects, patron of craftsmen. At one stage, he even became associated with the Creator God and with Osiris, the God of the Dead. This statue was the first ever acquisition by the museum in Florence. It was first housed at the Uffizi in 1753. High Priest of Ptah, Ptahmos, even makes an appearance in the famous painting Tribuna of the Uffizi from the mid-1700s. The son of Amenhotep III, Akhenaten, when he became pharaoh, shook the country to its core. He introduced a new art style to the people that had never been seen before. And, most importantly, he disregarded all the gods of Egypt in favor of his one god, Aten. This pharaoh was to be worshipped, and his wife, Nefertiti. Only through them could your prayers reach the gods. This unstable time saw the destruction of many statues of the king and queen after their rule, as is evident from the ruins of these royal feet. It wasn't all that bad during Akhenaten and Nefertiti's reign. The pharaoh handed out many extravagant gifts including some of the most fine linen garments, as shown on tomb walls of nobles at the time. If you were willing to serve Akhenaten, he would treat you well, no matter what class you were from. This man clearly wanted to show that he could afford a wig, showing his wig as transparent, with his shaved head visible underneath, a sign of nobility. One of the highest nobles from the reign of Amenhotep III and the early years of Akhenaten. His death mask made out of fine cartonage and linen and finely decorated with beautiful details. He was the brother of High Steward Hui and the son of the mayor of Memphis. Ramosa was a vizier during the time of Akhenaten and Amenhotep III. He disappeared from history because of his opposing religious views compared to Akhenaten. And Ramosa's tomb, which is one of the most beautiful tombs I've ever been into, Everything is white limestone, with only the black for the eyes laid out. We do not have Ramosa's mummy, but we do have his cartonage death mask, made in the same style as his tomb, white, with only the black for the eyes. He is absolutely beautiful. His mummy has never been found. Sinisterly, his death mask was filled in with mud. Maybe. His body was never laid to rest. This granite bust shows the army general of Akhenaten and the future pharaoh, Horemheb. Horemheb played a big part when Tutankhamun became the pharaoh after Akhenaten. This fragment from his tomb in Saqqara shows us the young Tut. 
during the reigns of Tutankhamun, his successor I, and Pharaoh Horemheb, Egypt became prosperous once again, for the only reason that they abandoned Akhenaten's new religion and new city, returned to Thebes and reinstated the gods. And under these post-Amana rulers, ancient Egypt's plethora of gods began to become favorable again, and the people began to worship the way they used to. And their most revered practice of entering the afterlife became attainable once again. The former gods had returned. And of them all, none more important than Osiris, the god who allowed you into heaven. Anubis, the god that led you to Osiris, began to rise in prevalence once again. The old burial practices returned, where Anubis would lead you to the next world. A world pretty similar to ours, only as a paradise. Tombs from the late 18th dynasty show the prosperity and the thoughtfulness that people put into getting into heaven. An official mourner attending to the sarcophagus of the deceased, being held up by the priest and adorned with bouquets of flowers. Not exclusive to royals and nobles, now anybody who could afford one was allowed a tomb. By the 18th dynasty, Pyramids were no longer constructed for burials. Instead, many people at Deir al Medina began to use a shape harking back to the Pyramid Age. Placed inside the tomb, these little pyramids were called, well, Pyramidians. Connected to the sun god Ra, they served the same purpose on a smaller scale and featured on the pinnacle of a new concept known as a funerary chapel at Deir al Medina where your family could leave you offerings. The population worshipped many gods and even wrote special letters to the gods with their prayers. At Deir al Medina, several goddesses appear in the life-giving tree. A cow goddess in a tree pouring out libations, Hathor, one of the most popular gods, especially during the new 19th dynasty. During the 19th dynasty, the presence of Hathor was immense. Apart from being the goddess of love and beauty, she became the Lady of the West, and in some cases replaced Anubis to lead you to Osiris. This is a loving scene between Hathor and the second pharaoh of the 19th dynasty, the father of Ramses II, Seti I. The most amazing piece, yet it's not actually very well looked after. It should be inside a glass case. It's from the tomb of Seti I, found by Giovanni Belzoni. In 1871, the Italian explorer Giovanni Belzoni discovered the longest tomb in the Valley of the Kings. The craftsmen of Seti's reign, in my opinion, were the highest skilled of all. Paying attention to even the smallest details, the pharaoh's name in beautiful technicolor standing next to Hathor. The subtle contours on the body of the pharaoh exude elegance. Hathor's decorated hair fit for a goddess. 
and the pharaoh's golden sandals with his long, elegant feet. The king holding hands with the Lady of the West. Due to the humid European conditions, much of the paint is dissolving away. From a four-sided pillar, the twin of this scene can be found in the Louvre in Paris. Preserved in a glass case, the colors are faithfully visible today. Seti I, one of the most prolific pharaohs, maintained Egypt's wider borders. He venerated the gods and started the biggest building project in the land. Expanding Egypt's economy and laying out the foundations for his son and future pharaoh, Ramses II. Many of the incredible artifacts in this museum were found by the great Italian explorer Giovanni Belzoni in the 1800s. During the 19th century, Egyptian antiquities attracted the attention of scholars, scientists, travelers, adventurers, and glorified tomb raiders. In the early 1800s, it resulted in the coming together of three extraordinary men. These were Henry Sold, Giovanni Belzoni, and Muhammad Ali Pasha. Henry Salt was a British consul general in Egypt. He came from a prosperous background. His father was a local physician. This gave him the means to study portrait painting. Unfortunately, he failed to build the reputation he had hoped for, but he managed to get a lucky break traveling across the globe as draftsman for a British lord. These voyages led to diplomatic and scholarly attainments and eventually the position of Consul General in Egypt. Belzoni, on the other hand, was the son of a barber, a profession which deservedly has been much more appreciated during the recent COVID lockdowns. Belzoni, however, didn't want to follow in his father's footsteps. So as a teenager, he rebelled and had other plans for himself. After being dumped by his girlfriend at 18, Belsoni was brokenhearted. His solution was to forget about girls and devote himself to God and join a monastery. The universe, however, had other plans for him and events led him to fleeing Italy and becoming a circus strongman in England. It is in England where he would meet his soulmate and devoted wife, Sarah, an intrepid travel companion, a major player in every aspect of his life. It's his training in hydraulics, however, that changed both their lives and led them to Egypt and Balzani face to face with the fearless Muhammad Ali Pasha. If I had to describe Balzani in a few words, he would probably be impulsive, for sure, innovative, resilient, determined, charismatic, tall, and strong, very strong. In fact, if he lived in this day and age, he would be a social media sensation and probably have millions of followers on Instagram. Mohammed Ali, the Pasha of Egypt, Although shorter in stature to girls only six foot seven inches, was also innovative and responsible for modernizing Egypt, improving Egypt's irrigation system and many other reforms at any cost, including gifting away countless Egyptian antiquities. It is in this social milieu that Belzoni, failing in his bid to sell his hydraulic machine to the Pasha, led him to discovering and transporting Egyptian antiquities and being introduced to Henry Sold. This would be the start of something resembling an Indiana Jones type movie where Belzoni would encounter obstacles, 
rivalry, assassination attempts, and betrayal. Henry Salt managed to convince Falzoni to move a colossal granite head of Ramesses II, weighing over a staggering seven tons. Many had failed to do this. Falzoni succeeded due to his engineering skills and using methods very similar to those the ancient Egyptians used. This was an odious task, as you can imagine, in the grueling Egyptian heat, but it made Salt aware of what an incredible man and how useful Belzoni was to him. This momentous statue now resides in the British Museum and attracts visitors from all over the world. For Belzoni, he marked the beginning of many discoveries and the transportation of Egyptian artifacts to the British Museum and other European museums. To Belzoni's dismay, Salt ensured all the glory and recognition went to him rather than to Belzoni. The artifacts delivered to the museums became known as the Salt Collection. Perhaps seeing Belzoni as an employee, he didn't feel the need to give him the recognition which Belzoni obviously felt he deserved. This led to Belzoni ensuring temples and tombs he discovered displayed his name and the date of discovery. His wife, Sarah, also needs to be mentioned because she was instrumental in his discoveries and her input is often ignored. On arriving back in England, the Belzonis ensured that his version of events was documented, leading to the publication of a book which became an overnight sensation in several countries. This book for a short time earned Belzoni the fame that he had dreamt of. Belzoni probably achieved what he wanted, and that is for all us museum visitors questioning every artifact we see labeled as the Salt Collection. We're going to be asking, is this actually part of the Salt Collection? Or is this glorious artifact that's been taken from Egypt the result of a unique set of skills, imagination, and ingenuity of a complex, fascinating man called Giovanni Belzoni. Many pieces discovered by Belzoni go uncredited, such as this beautiful image from Seti's tomb of the goddess of truth and justice, Ma'at, named here as the daughter of Ra, identified by the ostrich feather. Belzoni discovered countless tombs throughout Egypt, filled with some of the most beautiful treasures, including these alabaster canopic jars, still containing the mummified organs. In the completely looted tomb, he discovered hundreds of Shabtis of Seti I. Seti's son and successor, Ramses II, seen here in a small bust with an obelisk behind, reminiscent of the one in Florence. Today, we marvel in awe at the monuments of ancient Egypt, but who built these godly structures? Well-trained and skilled men were hired to create the empire. This scene shows many men at work in everyday life. Even one man stopping to look at us saying, what are you doing? While his scribal colleague designs the text for the back of the statue. The designer of Seti's tomb was a man called Baki and Baki lived at Deir al-Medina, where he drew this giant ostraca, the initial design of Seti's tomb. The tomb was then finished by a man called Pashidu, and Pashidu went on to design the tomb of Queen Nefertari. An ostraca was basically an ancient piece of notepaper where we can see the scribe practicing the pharaoh's profile before it became permanent. 
At the back of the Seti Ostraka is a young Prince Ramses II. A piece that has come from one of Egypt's most sacred sites, Abydos. Here we see Ramses II, beautifully depicted with his elaborately decorated crown and his huge name written here, Wusurmaitra, Ramses and he is holding an offering of two bracelets and a necklace to the god. Holding out the offerings to Osiris, Ramses is even shown here wearing a combination of different crowns. One included is the crown of the god of the afterlife, Osiris. It's undeniable that Ramses profile is one of the most distinctive well known for his military victories, but what physical ties remain? This is one of the most amazing pieces found in the tomb of Prince Ramses, the son of Ramses II. Artifacts that belonged to his father. This kilt that would have been worn by Ramses II made out of some of the finest linen. It's incredible to be so close to something so personal, owned by a pharaoh. Other such artifacts include this dagger, with a wooden handle topped with two falcons. Woven reed sandals that were probably worn by the prince himself, and interestingly, an intact wig made from straight human hair and painstakingly plaited. And the lid of a wooden makeup box, beautifully marked with the pharaoh's name in blue. Prince Ramses, the firstborn son from his second principal wife, was just one of over 100 children produced by Ramses II. Another man named Ramosa and his wife Tay were one of the wealthiest couples who lived at Deir el Medina during Ramses II's reign. His role was as chief scribe to Ramses. Ramosa worked alongside the vizier Passer to build up the following cult of the living god that was the Pharaoh. Ramosa and Tay were well looked after by Ramses, as is evident in their well-designed clothing and the tomb to allow them to meet with the god of the afterlife. Remnants of blue paint are still visible on Osiris on this stela. The wife of Osiris, Isis, and her sister, Nephthys, shown with their beautiful blue lapis hair identified by the symbols on their head. The exquisite detailing on this stela proves that Ramosa and Tay were a cut above the others as they could afford only the best craftsmanship. Eating a date with a lotus above her head before the offerings from her son, their daughter pouring out oils and incense for the couple's spirit. Beside the chair of the nobles, their grandchildren enjoying fruit, a glimpse at ancient family dynamics. Ramses II had one of the longest reigns of any Egyptian pharaoh. One of his many viziers that was around at the end of his father's reign and the beginning of his was called Passer. He served the royal court as vizier and high priest of Amun for over 50 years. Ramses afforded Passer a tomb. In the tomb, he placed a foundation stone displaying his titles. This is a pillar from the tomb of Ptah Mons, 
from Saqqara. Patamos was named as mayor in Memphis by Seti I after he served in battle with Ramses and Seti. We can see here Sekhmet shown at the top of the pillar. As we go down, we see Patamos shown as the mayor. As we go down, we see him as a priest, his first role being a priest. And he is holding the staff. But what is so interesting about this is that we get an idea of young Ramses II. Here at the back, we can see young Prince Ramses II with his side lock, very distinctly Ramses II. Patamos and his brother Ptahser, who was the army general of Ramses II, were both given tombs in Saqqara. Their tombs were discovered in 1885 by Theodore Davies, the man who spent much time at the museum in Florence. Even though there was much warfare during the reign of Ramses II, the people enjoyed a utopian-type lifestyle, as was written by residents and foreign allies. An exquisite colored scene from the tomb of Parser at Saqqara displays an array of beautiful priestesses pouring out the abundant harvests for Patamos. He carefully selects a succulent fig for his delectation. This is not fantasy, for we still have the urns used to pour the water out. Baskets of mummified figs, dates, Pomegranates and coconuts have been found, which we can see on the walls. The tomb of Patamos shows us the agricultural success and the beauty of Ramses II's reign. It is a wonderful thing to see items that were used by people in everyday life items that were selected with care and grace. Items that bring the life and the death of the ancient Egyptians to reality. By the end of the 19th dynasty, there was an influx in mummification, and thousands of sarcophagi were mass-produced from workshops for burials, pretty similar to modern-day funeral parlors. There were even different levels of mummification that you could choose from. Late 19th dynasty officials could afford well-crafted funerary objects. From royal attendants, to singers from the temple, all the way down to even one of Ramses III's horse stable managers. It would appear that the stable manager could not afford a decorated tomb, and thus he had his sarcophagus decorated with the gods he wanted to appease. The innovation of writing texts for the dead on papyrus during the 18th dynasty would become fully fledged in the 19th dynasty and used even more in the 20th dynasty. Scribes would produce a selection of funeral texts in order to help the deceased reach the afterlife. These books of the dead meant that the complex texts from the tombs could be condensed into a papyrus scroll. The end of the 20th dynasty saw a decline in Egypt's economy, meaning many tombs were then reused, raided, or destroyed. 
the high priests gained more control and would become more powerful than the pharaoh. At the start of the 21st dynasty, the country was divided between north and south. The pharaohs receded to the north and the high priests ruled in the south. Now their lives and burials became even more extravagant. This divide led Egypt into its third intermediate period, and chaos ensued. Taking advantage of the divide, the Meshwish, a division of the Libyan tribes, took power over the north and claimed themselves to be pharaohs. Even adopting Egyptian customs, Building tombs in Tanis, they were interred like the Egyptian kings before them. The hands at the sides was a sign of a commoner in a mummification in ancient Egypt. Arms crossed over the chest with clenched fists indicates a pharaoh. This male mummy and yellow coffin date to the 22nd Libyan dynasty. All the signs indicate that he could be one of the great Libyan pharaohs of the Third Intermediate Period, although his coffin is too damaged to reveal a name. Evidence of insert holes on his brow and chin indicate a royal cobra and beard. The Nubians to the south seized the moment and took power over Egypt, forming the new 25th dynasty. Tashrib Pranret, the nanny of the daughter of Pharaoh Taharka. She looked after Amun Yidris. And here we have the Nanny's death mask. It's probably the biggest death mask I've ever seen. It is absolutely enormous. But think about in the 25th dynasty when Princess Amun Yidris was adopted from Nubia by an Egyptian priestess and this Egyptian woman looked after her. And before that, Taharka, who was ruling Egypt as a Nubian at that time, had her put into such an elaborate burial. Tash Repranret raised Amun Yidris, who would eventually become the god's wife of Amun and rule Thebes on behalf of her father. A temple was built at Medinet Habu in Thebes, where she was interred in her tomb. Taharka afforded Tashrepranret an elaborate tomb in Thebes. Her sarcophagus and burial shrine is one of the largest and most unique in the history of Egyptian burials. Tashrepranret wears the vulture crown connecting her to the goddess and wife of Amun, Mut. A wood and silver mirror in its protective case and eyeliner were some of the many objects found in Tashrepranret's tomb. Ruling Egypt for less than 100 years, the Nubians fought off the Assyrians but were eventually chased out of Egypt by the native Egyptians. A line of weaker Egyptians were now on the throne. Soon they were conquered by a new power from the north known as the Persians forming the 27th dynasty. Needless to say, the Persian rulers made life unbearable for the Egyptians. This burial of a 27th dynasty singer 
proves that coffins were no longer individually made and had to be produced from what was available. Eventually, the Egyptians took back power, only to lose it again to the invading foreigners, the Persians. Their salvation would arrive from an unexpected Greek Macedonian man who liberated the Egyptians. We don't often see Alexander the Great depicted as an Egyptian or even as a pharaoh, only on a couple of statues and carvings. However, here we have something so unique. It is Alexander depicted as the god Hapi before an offering table with fish and plants hanging off the offering table. Isn't he just the most magnificent example of Greek and Egyptian art combined? When Alexander chased out the Persians from Egypt, he was named as the son of Amun and became Pharaoh. Uncontested by the Egyptians, he started a new line of Greek Ptolemaic rulers. He stayed less than six months, but he left a mark that was immense. One of my favorite pieces at the Archaeological Museum in Firenze is also one of the smallest. It is a silver coin showing Alexander the Great as a pharaoh. This small silver coin shows Alexander the Great and the goddess Hera on the back. We can tell that it's Alexander from his distinct features and his hair and also the name being on the back of the coin. However, a telltale sign to know that this is Alexander after he became a pharaoh is he is wearing the ram's horns showing that this is Alexander after he became pharaoh as he was named also as the son of Amun. One of Alexander the Great's favorite things that he found when he came to Egypt was the hoopoe bird, and he had it depicted in many temples. And this here is the favorite bird of Alexander the Great. Alexander's chosen successor to rule Egypt was Ptolemy. After Ptolemy came a phenomenal woman who became a female pharaoh, Arsinoe. The Ptolemies were a complicated lot, to say the least, and one of the most famous was the great queen and pharaoh Cleopatra VII. The patron goddess of Cleopatra, the one she most associated herself with, the one that she believed she was the reincarnation of, was the eternal mother goddess, Isis. Isis suckling her child Horus, the next pharaoh. Many bronzes were made in the forms of the gods as they believed bronze was a living metal, for when it oxidized, it grew green mold, which showed the metal was alive. This solitary 4,600-year-old god grew in popularity under the Ptolemies. Imhotep, the architect of the world's first ever pyramid, The museum in Florence yet again surprises us with more tangible links to the ancient world. Objects that look as familiar to us as they did to people 3,000 years ago. From beanies to tunics, even woven socks. Objects that we even use today, such 
as these embroidered slippers. And a cloak with a hood that we would never have thought was worn millennia ago. There's something fascinating about staring at the face of an ancient Egyptian. This white painted face, once gilded in gold, inlaid with precious stones for the eyes. These faces, from different dynasties across Egyptian history, were originally on coffins. In modern times, when tombs were raided, the faces were cut off of the coffin to be sold to a tourist who could easily pack it in their bag. The inhumane desecration of Egyptian artifacts did not only happen in modern times. Two thousand years ago, after the fall of ancient Egyptian religion, the Christian Coptics who lived in Egypt painted the cross over the sacred writings, taking away their pagan meaning. After the death of Cleopatra, the new Roman emperors who ruled Egypt still depicted themselves as pharaohs. Un-Egyptian people showing themselves in Egyptian style. In the first century AD, settlements in the Siwa Oasis and Fayum still depicted themselves in Egyptian style but with a mix of Greek and Roman. In the 4th century AD, the wine producers in Fayum who had been around for centuries still created death masks, a lifelike image beautifully crafted out of wood and wax paint. An unsurpassable culture with its monuments that have stood for thousands of years and that will be here far longer after we are all gone. Egypt is indeed the den of antiquity. Florence, a city filled with thousands of years of a rich cultural history spanning all the way back to ancient Egypt.